Hi there. Hello, hello. Josh Ellis here, the editor-in-chief of Success Magazine. The how. It's the question we've been trying to answer on your behalf since I started here at Success back in 2012. Not who, what, where, or when, necessarily, but how. Because it's the how, among other things, that makes all the difference when it comes to your success. That's why this month in the magazine, we are looking at performance. What do the top performers do that you could add to your routine to help you perform even better than you are right now? How do they do it? There are a lot of factors that affect your daily performance. A few of the more obvious ones you might think of are stress, mindset, or even the sleep you get. But what about things like self-awareness, influence, purpose, courage, productivity, and, well, just so many more? So here is my question to you. How are you improving your performance to get to the next level? Because you may think you are performing at your best, and maybe you're doing pretty well. But that doesn't mean you can let your guard down. We should always be actively working on the things in all areas that impact our performance. Because if we fall short in one, the other areas will start to slip too. The point of everything I'm saying is that people aren't born lucky or successful. The high performers and successful people that you see around you develop themselves and the right kind of habits to fuel their performance. They challenged themselves and pushed past people's expectations until they achieved their biggest and most outrageous goals. And then they kept at it, even after they achieved their goals, because there are always more opportunities out there. So back to where we started. How do you do the same? We tracked down a variety of successful high performers to talk about their methods for performing at their very best every day no matter what. So let's take a listen, and hopefully you'll hear some ideas and learn how to get going. Ready? Okay, let's get started. Hey, hey, Josh Ellis here, the editor-in-chief of Success Magazine. If you are listening to this podcast, I think it's safe to say that you are an achiever, someone who wants to be at the top of your game, not just when it's absolutely necessary, but every day, all day, because you have a drive for success. You want to live a life at your full potential and sustain high performance. Well, If that's the case, then you are most definitely in the right place because we have the man to help you with that here with us today. Brendan Burchard is the world's leading high-performance coach and one of the most watched, quoted, and followed personal development trainers today. We named him as one of the top 25 most influential leaders in personal growth and achievement just last year alongside the likes of Oprah, Ariana Huffington, Dave Ramsey, and Tony Robbins. He is a best-selling author, and his new book, High Performance Habits, How Extraordinary People Become That Way, is sure to join the rest of his hugely impactful works. Brendan holds the secrets to high performance, and he's going to divulge them all to us today. Brendan, my friend, It's great to have you here on Success Talks again. Josh, man, always an honor. And uh, I don't know if we'll divulge all of them, but boy, we'll give it a good crack. I promise you. Don't hold back. (laughs) I won't do that. We got a lot to cover. (laughs) I know. I'm excited and nice to have uh, hear your voice again, my friend. So, Brendan, uh, I will let people, if they are... um, unindoctrinated uh, to discover your backstory and more about you in the cover story of success this month. But right now, I want to get right at the heart of the matter and talk about high performance, which is your area of expertise. So Mm -hmm. why don't we start with the obvious? Can you define high performance from your perspective and give us an example so we can visualize it 
as we kind of move through our conversation today? Yeah, you know, I guess I have to answer that in two ways because I've studied this academically for so long, but I also coach it to people in general. So there's almost two different definitions. The academic definition would be succeeding beyond standard norms consistently over the long term. So when you think of high performance in that avenue, it just means we have to measurably show that you are consistently succeeding beyond the norms of your industry, of your career, of what other people are doing, or of your own personal measures. If you have a baseline of measurement that you've measured in any area of success in your life, whether it's health or goals, it's showing that consistently over the long term, you're outperforming those. It's getting better year over year over year in a measurable, objectively measurable way. And then personally, though, it usually just means people feel like they are living from their best selves, that they're in a space where they're fully engaged in what they're doing. They feel joyous while they're doing it and confident. And because of those emotional states, they know they're at their best and the results prove it. Okay, got it. Uh, that's good. So um, can we all be high performers or is it just not in the cards for some people? Maybe we've set up roadblocks or negative habits that we have to fix. Is there anything that's stopping any of us from doing this? No, there's nothing stopping anybody from being a high performer. It's completely measurable, improvable, malleable. It's not like we're all raised with a certain amount of success potential and it just stops there because this isn't you know, our role isn't in measuring just personality, like what do you like all the time? This is a question of can you increase performance? And in every measurable industry in the world, in every possible measurable task, people can improve. You know, when they get more training or better habits or better conditioning, they get better. There's almost no skill and no project and no activity in the world that we can't get better at. And what we've kind of proven with our research, we just completed the world's largest study of high performers ever done, collected information from over 195 different countries, over a quarter million assessments now filled out, over 2 million different people with data points on them. So the largest high performance study ever done that we know of. And what we found is that all the things that we usually say hold us back from succeeding over the long term just aren't true. Because high performance wasn't correlated with age or compensation or personality or strengths profile or, let's say, creativity or any part of our lives where we usually say, oh, I don't have that background. I don't have that luck. I'm, you know, I didn't have that perfect mix of things in my childhood that made me perfect. That's not about what this is. What we've proven is that long-term success is attainable by anybody in any field, in any industry. Okay, so the new book, which I mentioned in the intro, High Performance Habits, comes from years of your personal experience, but also that research you mentioned, the two million people that were in some way uh, surveyed or, or served as data points. Can, can you go into um, how that research played itself out? Where, what sort of questions did you ask? What was some of the uh, standards that, that, you, that you kept in, in um, trying to really measure this? Yeah, it, it was a long one. I'll tell you what. It's three years of research working with external academic teams, many graduates from you know some of the top psychology departments in the country, like the University of Pennsylvania, positive psychology, um, MAP students, with that's their master's in applied positive psychology. So it wasn't just the Brendan show kind of guessing here. This was a large-scale, empirically built study to try and figure out, first, how do we measure it? How do we know it when we see it? Because you have to define it. And it's different for each industry or different persons. But in general, we had to discover, are they succeeding in what they would call over the long term in what, whatever they're doing, however that would be measured. So we have to start with figuring out what are the objective measures here. And then what we do is we survey and we send out surveys to figure out, okay, who is performing best here based on their own self-reporting? Meaning this would be someone, Josh, saying, hey, I am really great and I've succeeded for three years here. That's wonderful. But then we got to match that up with external data and say, okay, is it true? Can we see it from how much they, you know, their promotions here, how much they get paid here? Can we see it from their self-reported levels of income? Can we see it from other correlates that we have already, through literature reviews and other empirical analysis, figured out correlate? with success. So we can ask them all those questions we already know that tend to lead people towards success. 
And then after you run all the data, that's really great. Data is important. Then it's doing structured interviews with the people who not only said that, yes, I'm a high performer, but then we could prove it. So then we sit them all down and we conducted over 300 interviews with them, in-depth structured interviews, academic style to see, okay, what is it they commonly talk about? What are the themes? What are their struggles? What are their habits? Then we drilled way down into habits, over 100 different habits that we could kind of surmise might lead to success. We took those 100 habits, beat them all down, beat them all down, beat them all down, came out with about 11 of them that seemed like they applied most of the time for most people. Mm -hmm. Then we had to ask, okay, these 11 habits, can everybody do them? Are they trainable? Are the people who are doing them, are they doing it on purpose or is it like an unconscious competence? And we kept beating it down, beating it down, beating it down. And it turned out that there's just six habits that correlate with long-term performance. And then I've had the blessing, as you know, in my, in my sort of real life, everyday life, I train millions of people every year. So we put these six habits out to test empirically, could they improve? And if they improved, did they actually correlate with performance? And then they did. Then the last piece is, I know this is a long answer, but it's a lot of diligence when it is. We built a full-scale professional assessment based on what we found. We ran that out again, and that went out to about 225,000 people as of this recording anyway, to check our correlations. And they held up. And so we just went through, boom, 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 measured, 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 and correlated over a series of studies that these were the six highest um, impact performance habits that we found. I think what people are gonna love about it is it's science-backed and heart-centered, because I, I know you've seen it too, a lot of the conversations usually about performance, especially in the old world of peak performance, was all about athleticism or fitness or something like that, and that's fine, that's cool, but you know, we have real lives. You and I go to work each day. You know, You and I have people that we care for each day, we all have our health, our career, our relationships, and we're trying to improve in all of them. And one of our goals with the habits was to say, we don't just want these to be performance habits in one area, either you know, for sales or for athleticism or something over here. We said, we want these to be habits that can be universally applied to multiple areas of your life to help you get ahead. So it's a very well-rounded, holistic approach to improving all the areas of your life. Okay, so all this research, um, three years worth, um, went into seeking answers to three fundamental questions surrounding performance, and I'll go ahead and list them off. Um, number one, why do some individuals and teams succeed more quickly than others and sustain that success over the long term? And number two, of those who pull it off, why are some miserable and others happy on their journey? And lastly, what motivates people to reach for higher levels of success in the first place? And what kind of habits and training and support help them improve faster? Uh, so, Brendan, why those specific questions? You could ask a million different questions about performance. Why those? And where did they originate from? Uh, well, they originated from the fact that I sucked. And <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is... You know, look at our everyday life. This 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 research and what I've done over the last you know twenty years of my career isn't you know departed from normal life. We all wake up in the morning and we all go to work or we serve a mission or work with our families and we notice some family members or some people at work or some you know leaders in our industry getting ahead faster than ourselves. And so that first question was that: Why is it some of these people are succeeding more quickly than me? And why are they able to sustain that success over the long term when I seem to have, you know, uh, sometimes I'm at bat and I do well, sometimes I'm bad, I don't do well. Like, where's my consistently, why is it that consistency, uh, you know, when you really look at it, is so key to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. How are they saying so consistent? But second, why is it they're happy? Because sometimes I was succeeding and lots of, look, there are a lot of high achievers who are miserable. And I saw that in, I was blessed to work for the world's largest consulting company at the time, Accenture. And when I was there, I had the blessing of working on change management and leadership. And it inspired a lot of these questions too. And I would see that some of the partners that I worked with there were miserable. Yes, they were high earning. Yes, they had big teams, but they were miserable people. And then another partner over here at same level, same level of teams, happy and excited. Why? How were they striving satisfied versus their peers? And then the last one was what motivates people to reach for that level of success and what habits and training help them improve faster. That came from me wanting to be practical. 
Because I also noticed in my life, sometimes I'd wake up in the morning very clear about what I have to do, but by two or three o'clock, my motivation had waned. And uh, I know you're everyone at Success is big fans of Jim Rohn. And Mm -hmm. Jim said that, you know, motivation gets you in the game. Habits keep you there. And so what were the habits that really made the difference? And what makes this book unique is we identified the ones that make the most difference. They're what we call the needle movers. They're the habits that are almost meta habits. By improving these habits, all other habits tend to improve and life outcomes improve as well from health and happiness to career success. All of these measurable things that we know about somebody's life tend to improve if they've enacted these six habits. So I will say that I can understand how someone can be a high performer and achiever and be miserable, right? Uh, It it seems Mm -hmm. like sometimes we just have so much going on, uh, whether it's work or or, or a side hustle or family. You can have a great family and still be stretched so thin, right? Um, But sometimes it's, you know, it's Thursday night and there's a great margarita special and you just want to go there or you want to you want to watch the college football game on Saturday instead of being on, you know. That's so right. so tell us then what separates the miserable ones from the happy ones. And there's so much stress that, that the happy ones have to just have a workaround for. Right. Yeah. And well, and the great news is let's give some language to help people figure this out. And that is there's a difference between just a, an achiever or a striver and a high performer. Because it turns out high performers are not miserable. Matter of fact, if somebody's achieving something and they're miserable and happy, the reality is they're not a high performer. Because high performance was so strongly correlated with happiness. And what we also found was that, and this was a stunning finding for the research, is that high performers are no more stressed than their peers and matter of fact, they're even more resilient and better at dealing with stress, which is why they became high performers. So if you're in a place where you're constantly stressed and constantly miserable and you're achieving external things, good for you. You're, you're, you're achieving. You're maybe winning in that area, but you're not winning in life. And high performance, as we measured it, demands that you have a heightened level of happiness, that, that level of joy and engagement that can only come from some of these habits that we talk about in the book. Okay, we have buried the lead long enough. You mentioned the six habits, what are they? Mm. Uh, So we broke them up into two separate types of habits, three habits each, and these categories, we didn't start the research with that, by the way. I actually didn't anticipate this book leading to where it did. Um, But let's call it personal habits and then social habits. The personal habits, are the habits that we do kind of inside to take care of our lives to help us perform at our highest levels. Number one is seek clarity. It turns out high performers seek clarity more consistently than their peers. And we know that some people, you know, throughout the year, they really only seek clarity, I don't know, like one day a year, you might call it like um, New Year's, you know, and the rest of the year, they're not really that introspective and thoughtful about what's important to them, about who they're wanting to be, mm-hmm. where they're wanting to go, how they want to interact with people. We all know people who, who are, some are more self-aware than others, but what we found was that high performers seek clarity on such a more consistent basis in specifically three ways. One, they're very clear about who they want to be in every given performance situation. Meaning, before they go in the meeting, Josh, they're saying, okay, who do I want to be in this meeting? How do I want to come across? They're asking, how do I want to treat the other people in here? In their overall career, they're saying, what skills do I know I need to develop to go to the next level? In their overall life, they're consistently asking, what would I find most meaningful for this next stage of my life? They're seeking clarity in that way consistently. They're also consistently looking for the feeling that they're after. You know, they're asking them questions like, what's the primary feeling that I want to bring to this situation? So they're not going into a situation saying, I hope I feel good about it. They say, okay, how do I make myself feel good now before I go in? So it's there. Mm -hmm. And then they're very consistently breaking down on a weekly basis what they found meaningful. They're very good at looking back at a week and saying, what was meaningful there? How could I do more of it in the future? So that's the first habit. And then the other ones I'll go through faster because I know you have some specific questions about each of them. Sure. 
Second habit in the personal habit category is generating energy. It's learning how to release tension and set intention so you have higher levels of energy throughout the day because most people are losing their energy. Not, it's not that they just need some new diet plan or to work out more. We, we know those things are often very true, but they also, high performers tend to release the tension as they go throughout the day from experiences. If they walk out of a tense meeting, they're the ones more likely to go walk around the building and take a breather to release that negative energy and then set an intention to have a higher level of energy when they go back to work, to be more focused, to be more clear. They tend to be more joyful and they tend to optimize their physical health. High performers are 40% more likely to work out five times per week than their underperforming peers. 40% wow. more likely. It's a huge differentiator for high performers. Then the third personal habit is raising necessity. And that is about understanding how to get the best from ourselves, like making performance improvement a necessity that we have to have versus just a preference. We can talk about that one, I know. And then the second category is social habits. And those ones we can go through, they're pretty straightforward. Increasing prolific quality output, it means they identify what they need to be productive at, and then they focus on it. Uh, we like to say they're good at remembering that the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Um, they're more likely to know the five moves to achieve their goals than anybody else. Meaning if you said and said, okay, what's your major goal? And they told you the goal, they could bust down the five things they're doing to move towards it faster than those around them. Underperformers typically don't know the answer when you ask them that. High performers almost always know the answer. Then another habit is develop influence. That is, yeah. yeah. And this is where I think this book really shines. And, and I would say that not because I'm bragging, but because I was surprised. Often, you know, psychologists don't walk across the hallway to talk to the sociologists. So a lot of the books you read on peak performance or psychology or success are written as if you live on an island by yourself and it's all an internal game. And that's just not reality. We can't succeed long term without developing influence with the people around us because the people around us support us, cheer us on, help us carry across the finish line. No one succeeds by themselves anymore in a super connected world. It's almost easier to succeed with just people skills than, than without the passion and perseverance, isn't it? <laughs> sometimes, because sometimes you, you get passion from other people or persevering, you know, that sense of progress gives you more momentum and motivation. But certainly one of the biggest missing gaps in most of the research done, I would say, in the last 10 years across all performance and psychology has been a, I would say, just a lack of emphasis of how important it is for high performers to really develop influence with their team, with their family, with their coaches, with those around them. And, and we all know that because if you have a negative environment, it's hard to succeed, but we all know it. Like there's a lot of people, even just look in athletics, the number of potentially great athletes who bombed out because they couldn't get along with the team or their coach. And so they failed. And so you could, I know lots of people with lots of passion, lots of perseverance, lot, they practice a lot, but they're not developing the people around them. So their lives aren't developing. And then the last one, the sixth habit is to demonstrate courage. Mm -hmm. High performers in both self reporting and then when we interviewed their peers, we found out they were more likely to share their ideas, tell the world what they really think, feel, believe, desire, need. And they were also more likely to stand up for other people, stand up for other people's ideas in meetings, champion other people. When, whenever there was risk or uncertainty, they were more likely to have daily habits stepping into that uncertainty. And their ability to demonstrate courage on a consistent basis by sharing their truth, by knowing what they were fighting for, by dealing with struggle in a way that they honored it and anticipated it. But most importantly, that they were, they were taking real steps in real directions that scared them. You know, I think about you, Josh, being a high performer. It's, I remember one of the first, time, first things I got to read from you uh, after we started working together, you had sent... Um, You'd stepped into the boxing ring, if oh, I remember right. Oh, yes. Yes, you know? yes, yes, I did. That, I, I made that mistake. <laughs> That's a scary. That was an awesome article, by the way. Um, <laughs> but that was demonstrating courage. That's saying, 
you know what? I'm curious about this area. I don't know what it's like. It definitely scares me, but I'm going to give it a go. High performers do that more often than others. And they don't do it because that's just part of their psychology or they had the perfect parents or whatever. It's because they know that is necessary to perform better. You must demonstrate courage and extend yourself and develop into what you must and become who you must in order to reach your mission, in order to serve your mission, in order to serve those around you. And so, I mean, I look at my entire career, almost everything I do today, I was terrible at. And they were, none of them were a natural or innate strength or talent. I mean, I sucked at video. Mm -hmm. Some people still would say I still do. (laughs) So I I had no skills, no development, no, you know, proclivity towards marketing at all or business at all. Those are things I learned and I worked super hard to develop because I realized they were necessary for me to serve a mission. And I, one of the hopeful messages of this book is that you can become a high performer if you choose to. And it ultimately comes down to that choice and then developing and focusing on these six habits and you'll watch your results absolutely expand. So one of the things that I love about this book is, yes, there is a ton of research that went into it. And and what I'm getting at is this thing almost works like a textbook for uh, or a workbook for how to develop those habits. Um, Mm -hmm. You've got the you've got the academic rigor that went into it. And then to sort of personalize it for all of the readers, there is, um, you know, a, a fill in the blank section with each char- with each chapter to basically help them figure out what they need to do to develop these habits. And so you started off with clarity um, and, and it seemed to be uh, one that, that you were really passionate about as we we're talking just a moment ago. So why don't we show off um, some of the ways that you can help people develop these things? Can, can you expand on how do you make clarity a habit? Yeah, absolutely. And just for that perspective, for 20 years, I've done the personal experimentation too. I've read a book a week in personal development or business or psychology, leadership. And for the last 10 years, my entire career has been coaching and training people on this topic. And so I wanted to bring a lot of those lessons learned into the book as well, because you can say, you know, academically, well, high performers, we we can prove that they They seek clarity. They ask themselves these types of questions more often than other people. They define themselves and their interactions and their outcomes in these ways. We we can measure that, but ultimately the question is, okay, now how do you get it? But I wanted to make it so practical. And so each of the habits, so for example, seek clarity, that's the habit. We give you three practices in the book to develop that. As an example, we'll say, okay, practice one. Envision the future for. You need to have vision and consistently set clear intentions for who you want to be. That's one of the future four. Mm -hmm. How you want to interact with other people. What skills you need to be developing. How, why, and when. And then how you would ultimately make a difference or serve with excellence in your primary field of interest. And so we take people through thinking activities, what we call sentence completion activities, where I'll start a sentence and then have you know ellipses at the end, dot, 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 and ask you to finish it. And by knowing the practices for each of the habits, the more you do each of the practices, the more the habit becomes instilled in you, the more it becomes just deliberate and conscious. It's muscle memory. It's muscle memory. It, so the book is full of, while people will buy it for the six habits, what they're really going to love is each of the six habits comes with three practices that are so tactical, so tangible that you can do literally every day or every week that that habit will just become part of you. And that's how we help you reach high performance. So in the September issue of the magazine, folks who saw that one, the one with Elon Musk on the cover, we excerpt um, a particular chapter of the book. And it's the, it's the one that I think maybe was the most surprising to me. But when I, when I read it, I'm like, well, of course. And that is the one about necessity, necessity as this <laughs> right. driver. Because, you know, a um, let's say um, a, a military um, um, troop or brigade or something, they, they do things because they, they just do them because they have to, right? Mm-hmm. Or, 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 or why did you rush into the burning building to save this person? Because it was, nece- it was necessity. And I think about our team and deadlines. Like, we don't miss deadlines. Why? 
because you don't miss deadlines. You just don't, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so when I when I when I read that, I'm like, this this makes so much sense that necessity is such a big part of performance. And I I, I would love it if you just expand on that one. Yeah, th- you know it's so funny. That was the most surprising one to you because it was definitely the most surprising one to me, and it cost me about eight months of backpedaling with the researchers to try to figure out because we just didn't know it was going to be a thing. Uh, we sensed there was something there, but until a couple of structured interviews that we really found it to be so critical. And you're right, it, it seems so basic, but I like to say, you know, sometimes common sense is not common practice. Mm-hmm. And that's why so many potentially great people fail to reach their full potential because they're they're not doing the fundamentals. And this happens to be a fundamental. High performers raise the necessity of their performance in their mind before the activity. And I'll give you a couple of different ways to think about this one because it ended up being so critical. The correlations of this one were so high. In our first initial rounds, they weren't because we didn't know how to measure it or talk about it. or uh, we, like I said, So we had, we had to go back and try to understand what this was. And what it was is that, um, let's give an example. I think I used in the book, a gold medalist sprinter who I was blessed to coach. Um, one time we were out of the line and I said, you know, before we start the race here, how do you know who's going to win this race? And he said to me, I'll tell you what, the person I would bet on is the person who gets to the blocks, sets up, looks up, and then says to him or herself, I need to win this one for my mom. Mm-hmm. I got to win this one for my country. And what they're doing is not just tapping into a why, but they're really leveling up the necessity that they feel to perform with excellence right then. There are different people did it in different ways. They Some people talk to themselves, repeat affirmations. Some people just visualize or daydream. But they're, what they're really doing is ratcheting up the necessity where them doing well in that situation is no longer a preference. It becomes a must. It's like deep in them. And they're like, I have to do it. And we think that people just wake up like that all the time, right? The, the popular culture, psychology, pre-performance people, you, 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 they, they think that these people just exist where they wake up every day, completely fueled, completely driven to kick butt all day. But that's not true. These folks, high performers are deliberately willing themselves with necessity. They're asking questions like this, some of the practices, you know, they're asking, who needs me on my A game the most right now? They're asking, what is it about who I am that makes it imperative for me to deliver today? They're constantly speaking their why to themselves, to others. They're putting themselves out there so that it would be, you know, socially embarrassing if they didn't do well. They're surrounding themselves with people who raise their own necessity, other people who are helping them level up. And all of this is increasing their performance necessity. And it's an art. There's something inside that has high standards of expectation for doing well, and they remind themselves of that. They also tend to have an obsession with the topic. And that made me feel good because I often thought, geez, I have my obsession for high performance here. It must be crazy. And we all think if we're obsessed about something, we're crazy and we're silly, you know, because, you know, you know how it is, Josh, like passion. Uh, I would say grit was never enough because, you know, lots of people have passion, but they don't necessarily perform well over the long term. And the reason that is, is high performers, they're not just passionate. They're kind of obsessed. And high performers learn over the period of time, their obsession, that's part of their strength. And then the external side to raising necessity, there's usually a social obligation or social duty or a sense of contribution or purpose that I have to make. And I feel that pull. And that's why I perform well. And the last one, you nailed it earlier, which was deadline. (laughs) That necessity, you know, I I think it was also Jim Rohn who said that, um, and I'll get this one wrong, but it was something to the effect of, uh, passion without urgency loses its fire. And we've got to have some type of urgency to really be at our best. Another thing that you talk about is confidence. And I know that there are people who will pick up the book or who are listening to us right now who hear those habits and say, well, I only got one of those or, or, or something like that. Right. So um, how can people develop the confidence um, that they can 
add these clubs to their bag, so to speak? Yeah. Well, the good news is every one of these is malleable. Every you can every one of these habits. They're not unconscious habits that just happen naturally. They're deliberate habits. And I wanted the book to be about that. I wanted the book to be about things you purposefully do because I want I want my clients and my students to be climbing mountains consciously and to be conscious of why they're good. That will make them better leaders and better servants. And so I really thought that that's that's important. I don't want just the unconscious stuff. I want the, what can you purposefully do? So the whole book is set up for you to have confidence that you can do these. But one note about confidence that people are loving in the pre-read of, of this book is that what we found at the base, if we, if we keep digging down into why high performers were confident, and we kept digging down and kept digging down, what makes them confident? Digging down, digging down. Yes, competence, you know, know having some expertise, Absolutely. Yes, community, having some influence around. Yes, knowing how to be productive and using your mind to keep your energy and staying clear. All those things, those are all great. But at the base, if we kept going down, digging down, digging down, underneath all of confidence is usually curiosity. Mm -hmm. That they were so curious about something that they would sort of learn about it, step into the unknown, try test. And they were curious as they were testing, even if they failed, they were resilient because they were curious enough to ask, well, why did I fail? And that curiosity caused the next action of learning. That curiosity caused the next action of learning. And certainly enough curiosity, action of learning led to competence. Enough competence led to that confidence, competence loop. And all of a sudden they felt better. So I tell people, it's like, if you're a curious human being about you being better in your relationships, in your career, your family, your health, then read the book. Because this book, I know, it's not the end-all, be-all of high performance. I even talk about in there that, look, research in this area is really emerging. And I'm happy to be part of that pioneering conversation about it. But I know that when you read the book, it's going to be like a gateway. You're going to think about so many areas of your life that you can improve leveraging each of these habits. And now the best thing is, instead of asking, gosh, what should I focus on to get better You'll know exactly what to focus on because we've correlated. These are the six habits to focus on. Focus on these and you win. Brendan, I I got to say, I'm so glad that you joined us here again for Success Talks today. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm performing better already just uh, having spent I'm this in. little time with you. I'm so glad to be here. Hey, before we get to the quickies at the end, I, I want to uh, remind people that you're a part of something really cool that we're doing, uh, Success Accelerator. If you visit success.com, you can find out uh, more about it. But uh, you're, the, you're the star of the show, Brendan. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, really, the success community is the star of the show. I mean, I'm I'm just teaching and training, but I'm also bringing in a lot of the perspective from the success teachers and trainers, past and present, from whether it's John Wooden or Jim Rohn to, you know, contemporary people. We've got T.D. Jakes, who are, does it with me, and mm -hmm. uh, footage from Mel Robbins and all the other success crew that you've got. So uh, it's an awesome program because every single month they have the opportunity to tune in. We do some new success training from me and other members of the uh, success community, and uh, they get just unbelievable access to some great bonuses and features that no one else gets. It's kind of like the the best of success, I think. Yeah. And then a live experience of training every single month. It's really unique and it's live. So people love it. It's just very hands-on. Yeah. And, and, uh, I, I know that the early reviews of folks that, uh, that have signed up, they're loving it. So, uh, before we let you go, um, I have just a few more questions we like to ask of just about everyone who joins us for success talks. If you're ready, sir. Let's do it. Okay. What is the best piece of advice anyone has ever given you? Mm, uh, that's an easy one. That's my dad. Um, I lost, uh, we lost my dad in 2009 to acute myeloid leukemia. Mm -hmm. And uh, right before he passed away, I happened to call him and asked him if I could record the call. Because, you know, we grew up in a time that we didn't have like video cameras and on our phones, you know, and I didn't have much like recordings from my dad. He was going through um, his second round of chemo when we did it. And I asked him, you know, what he wanted us kids to remember and, and to do. And he said a couple of things and it really, the advice he gave, I realized even though he was telling me sort of all over the phone, he'd been telling me that. And all of us kids throughout our life, these seven things, basically, it, my dad's message to us was always be yourself, be honest, 
do your best, take care of your family, treat people with respect, be a good citizen, and follow your dreams. And at the end of his life, he wanted to reiterate those and, and of course, to take care of each other and take care of my mom, which we have. And uh, I revisit his ad advice all the time. And, and, you know, I've been blessed with this crazy, huge social media following, but the great joy I honestly have in that is I, I put together a quote card of my dad's seven points I just mentioned now. Mm -hmm. And that is the most shared and liked thing out of all of my years on social media. That's awesome. That is the most, yeah, my dad's thing is the most popular thing I've ever done, <laughs> sharing my dad's <laughs> voice. So parents out there, you remember you're passing on a message to your kids and it will travel beyond you. So be conscious of it. Very cool. Okay, the next one that's on the sheet is something about like what your spirit animal is, but I I want to get <laughs> I want I'm scratching that out. I want to get real okay. here, Brennan. This is the real <laughs> this is the the real question. Yeah. Originally, you are from Montana? <laughs> Who the hell is from Montana? I know, I know there's not a lot of us. I think we might be just we're about to crack or we just cracked a million people there. Oh my God. Um yeah, I'm from, I'm from uh, I, I grew up in Butte Conrad, Great Falls, Missoula. And so if you're not from Montana, that doesn't mean anything. If you're from Montana, it means a lot, especially going in that order. You can tell we kind of moved up in life a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I grew up in Butte and it was a, a very tough, tough town. Um, it was an Irish sort of Catholic mining town that had been economically depressed for almost a century. Um, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity there. It wasn't a lot of um, good things going on while, while I was there, at least in, in our neighborhood. Um, but I lucked out. My mom and my dad really cared for us kids. And while we were, you know, very poor and struggling a lot, uh, mom and dad had a lot of positivity and abundance. And so I would say I didn't grow up with a lot, but I grew up with total abundance because of the mindset and the heart and the love of my parents. And so when people say, Brendan, you're really lucky. I'm like, you know what? I, and not, not in a lot of areas, but I, I, yeah, you know, if I lucked out on anything, I lucked out on the parent train. I had two good ones, you know, <laughs> then that, that really shaped me as much as they struggled. Um, and as much as they really worked really hard to raise us four kids, they were good people. And I saw them fight and struggle so much in, in their lives and their careers that seeing their resilience and positivity and belief in themselves and the, us kids, that made a huge difference to me. I dare say that uh, they did a pretty good job. Okay. Uh, thanks, brother. Lastly, how do you define success? Mm. How do I define success? Wow. Define it. Uh, I would say it's reaching and experiencing as much personal freedom in your life as you can. And uh, I define personal freedom as essentially that, that freedom that comes from being who you truly are and seeking things that you truly care about. I think if you're doing those two things, if you're really being the best of who you are as consistently as you can, and you're pursuing things that you really care about in the world that, that either bring you deep joy, engagement, satisfaction, fulfillment, or a sense of contribution, if you're doing those two things, you're more free than a lot of other people. And that's not only going to bring you success, I would say that is success. He is Brendan Burchard. The new book is High Performance Habits. Check him out. Success Accelerator, Success Live, Long Beach. You're everywhere, Brendan, and on the cover of this month's issue of Success Magazine. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Brendan, <laughs> Thank thanks so much. Enjoyed it. It's been a true honor. Thanks. Great hearing your voice again. Man, Brendan has so many great ideas to share. I hope you were taking notes. If not, then restart the episode again and be sure you have a pen and paper in hand. Before you do that, though, I have a few things I want to point out so you can take special note. First is Brendan's definition of high performance. He says that high performance is consistently succeeding beyond the norms and living as your best self. Got that? The key word there is consistently. It isn't about achieving something once and then calling it quits. You have to do it every hour, of every day, of every week, of every year. Exhausting, right? But it does have its benefits. Brendan pointed out that high performance and happiness go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. 
So by being consistent in your success and living as your best self, you'll find and live true happiness. The key components of performance that Brendan talks about are those six habits and implementing them in a deliberate and conscious way in your life. It goes back to the consistency aspect we just discussed. You need to practice these habits in every area of work and life to be a top performer because, as Brendan so aptly put it, common sense is not common practice. And we need to always remember the fundamentals. So many of these habits that Brendan shared definitely are fundamental. And then finally, we discuss the confidence that high performers all seem to have. That confidence, Brendan pointed out, comes from curiosity and stepping into the unknown. Be willing to try and test new things to build your confidence, bolstering you to move forward no matter what. So now that we've done a little recap, be sure and go back and listen to the discussion again and look for these specific points as well as anything else that speaks to you personally. Success listeners, Shelby Skirhawk here, Director of Digital Content for Success.com and co-host of the podcast Success Insider. We often hear that success requires personal sacrifice of some kind, missing a child's game because you're traveling, skimping on a few hours of sleep to finish your report. But what about more serious sacrifices, like compromising your personal beliefs or faith to fit in? Our guest today believes that you don't have to sacrifice your faith or belief system to achieve the very highest levels of success. In fact, he made a living from putting his faith at the forefront of what he does in the entertainment industry. Devon Franklin is a best-selling author, spiritual success coach, and former Sony Pictures executive and CEO of Franklin Entertainment, a production company in conjunction with 20th Century Fox. He produced the surprise hit film, Miracles from Heaven, and is executive producer of the much-anticipated animated film, The Star. He's a powerhouse who believes that there's truly a place for the spiritual and the secular in success. And his new book, The Hollywood Commandments, A Spiritual Guide to Secular Success, reveals 10 life-changing lessons picked up from his over 20 years in the entertainment industry. They're great lessons for everyone, and he's here to talk about them today. Devon, thanks so much for joining us and looking forward to our discussion. Uh, thank you, Shelby, for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Really blessed to be here. So first off, you've been named by Variety as one of Hollywood's 10 producers to watch and one of the most influential Christians under 40. So you might think that those are two very different, almost opposite distinctions. So how did you, a very spiritual and belief-driven man, get into the entertainment industry? Uh, you know, it's funny because it's like when I hear that introduction, I'm like, they don't seem that opposite to me. I mean, probably because I'm doing <laughs> it or living it, uh, you know, but I got into entertainment uh, at the age of 18. You know, as a young kid, I grew up in the church, always had dreams of, of being in entertainment. And, um, you know, of course, growing up in a com faith community, that was not always shined upon. It was like, oh, you know, you shouldn't go to Hollywood. But I really felt like that was my calling. So at 18 years old, I went to the University of Southern California. Uh, I majored in business, minored in film. Interesting fact, I got rejected from the USC Film School as a, as an undergrad. Really? And so, yeah, yeah, they, they didn't think that I had what it took to make it, <laughs> uh, which actually was a blessing in disguise because it allowed me to take a business major mm -hmm. and it gave me more time to pursue an internship. Yeah. So that first semester, freshman year, I went in and um, the management company that managed Will Smith it was called Handprint Entertainment at the time, and they were offering an internship. And so I went in and, uh, you know, did the internship. And it was funny because when I sent in my resume, I had my picture on it. And the woman that I was interviewing with, she crossed my picture off mm -hmm. and she turned it around in the interview and said, you know, there are people here who won't hire you based on how you look. This is a, not a modeling agency. You know, I was like, oh, man, this is terrible. Um, and so, you know, long story short, we ended up rebounding because she asked me why I wanted to be in entertainment. And I told her I wanted to make change. And at first she thought I was talking about money. And I said, no, I want to make change in the world. I said, I believe entertainment is one of the most powerful mediums in the world. And if I can be a part of it, then I can actually make content that can change people's lives for the better. And that really helped turn the interview around. And at the end of the interview, she said, you know, is there anything else you want me to know? 
Now, growing up as a Christian, you know, I observed the Sabbath. So Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, you know, I wouldn't go to baseball games, football games, school dances. And so that was a really big part of, of my faith. And so I told her, I said, you know, uh, if you want me to take this job, uh, I'm, I don't work on the Sabbath. So if taking the job requires me to work on the Sabbath, then I won't take it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at first she looked at me confused, like, what is he saying? And then after she processed it, she said, no problem, we'll work around that. And that was really the first uh, memory I have at the very beginning of getting into entertainment, where at the start, there was always a merger between the function of wanting to be in entertainment and also the practice of still adhering to my to my values and to my faith. Right, right. Well, so in your book, I mean, you talk about the stereotypes of Hollywood and, and you know, going off to Hollywood as, you know, the, the devil's playground or, you know, modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me ask you, so you've been in this industry a long time. You've met all walks of life in the industry. So what's been your experience with that stereotype? I mean, why is Hollywood so notorious for this salacious nature? You know, it's it's interesting because, see, my experience in Hollywood has been very different than what most people would think. You know, I have be, there's been an embrace of my faith. There's been an embrace of my belief. Uh, what I have believed has opened doors. It has not closed doors. And so I think one of the reasons why, you know, Hollywood is so notorious for, you know, its quote unquote salacious nature is because that's the portion in the public that gets publicized. So when you go to the supermarket, you know, you look at the checkout stand, what's there? You know, us we Weekly and Star and Inquirer and all of those things take one aspect of the entertainment industry in Hollywood and they magnify it. And that's ultimately what gets the headlines. But because I've worked in Hollywood for 20 years, I can tell you that ma- the majority of Hollywood is filled with hardworking, good people of integrity, people who have families, people who want to do good in the world, people who are committed to making content that can change people's lives. So the portion we see in the media is just a glimpse. It's not the full picture. And so it's very easy to take a glimpse and make an assumption. But when you actually see the whole picture, you would, it would challenge what you think in the media. And that's what my experience in Hollywood has done. And that's why, you know, whenever I'm talking to people, they're kind of, they look at me sometimes dumbfounded because I'm saying the Hollywood you think, you know, is not the real Hollywood that's out there. Yeah. Well, so also in the book, you write that the church didn't teach me to be successful. Hollywood did. So unpack that a little bit and how these lessons that you learned, how they lend themselves to success. Yeah, you know, in the book I talk about this is a statement that might get me kicked out of some (laughs) churches. But, you know, it's all right. I'm going to speak my truth. You know, I got to I got to tell the truth. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I think for too long, there's been this division between the the spiritual and the secular. And what has happened is that, you know, sometimes the church can prepare you with the right spiritual teachings, you know, the right understanding of, you know, what life's about and why that is important. But sometimes what I have found is that if you regulate your training and your knowledge to what you learn in the church, you're going to miss what is really required to be successful, which is a real time time experience in whatever industry you aspire to find success in. And so when I say the church didn't make me successful, Hollywood did. What I mean is that I had to go to Hollywood. I had to put myself in the quote unquote belly of the beast. I had to immerse myself. I had to commit to this pursuit and I had to learn, you know, what's required of success. How do you, you know, develop films? How do you deal with people? How do you handle politics? How do you navigate difficult situations? How do you stay persistent, you know, yet patient? How do you maintain your values, but still pursue your vision. These were all the things that I learned in Hollywood. So it was like the church gave me a great spiritual foundation, but Hollywood is what gave me the foundation for success in industry. And that's what I talk about in the Hollywood commandments is how you need to go into whatever industry you're, you're, you're believing you're supposed to be successful in and learn that industry and study that industry. Because in those, these industries, in secular environments, buried within them are the keys to success. And I wanted to share those keys because too often some of my, you know, uh, members of the community of faith, they stop at what the church teaches them. And as a result, never experience the fullness of their calling. So if you were standing in front of um, in front of a young man or a young woman who is interested in, in pursuing the industry and, and moving off to Hollywood to get that start, what advice would you give them? You know, I would give them first, you know, you got to know your why. Why do you want to do it? 
uh, very important. You know, Hollywood is not a place for the faint at heart. So you got to really check your intention. Uh, once you've checked your intention and if it is authentic and if it is true, then you have to go. Um, there are certain places and industries that are environmental. And what I mean by that is that you have to go where those industries are happening. It's very difficult if you live in Atlanta and you say, hey, I want to be in the tech industry. It's going to be very difficult if you don't go to Silicon Valley. And the same thing with Hollywood. If you feel like you have an entertainment dream, then you got to come to where Hollywood is and you got to pursue it and you got to give yourself over to it. Too often people quit and they say, oh, I was out here for a year. It was too hard. Then maybe it wasn't designed for you. So I would tell anybody interested that you got to know your why. And then once you come, you got to commit, you got to persevere because if it's meant for you and you are designed to be successful, it absolutely will happen. So let's talk a little bit about your journey. So, you know, you're living out what you believe your your calling is. So talk about that for a little bit because people are always on the hunt for their calling. How did you discover yours and, and what did that mean in terms of how you acted and what steps you took to live it out? Yeah, you know, my calling is, it's a really interesting, you know, I love the question because I think the call of what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it is something that that haunts so many of us, so many people that I counsel and coach uh, in their own lives. They deal with this issue of, you know, what am I called to do? And then once I hear the call, how do I go about it? And for me, I just, you know, my father died uh, when I was nine years old. Uh, he died at the age of 36 from a heart wow. attack. And yeah, yeah. And my mother raised my uh, older brother, myself and my younger brother, you know, by herself, pretty much, along with my aunts. And so it was a village that surrounded us, you know, when my father died. And I'll never forget, you know, we didn't have money for therapy. Uh, but the thing that did happen is that being involved in the church and also watching entertainment, that was my therapy. And that put what helped me heal. And as I began to immerse myself in the, the, you know, Back to the Future and the Color Purples and Star Wars and all these great films, and then being, you know, totally wrapped up in the sermons that I would hear on the weekend, you know, I really felt that my calling, you know, was to go to Hollywood, you know, was to make content that could uplift the world and inspire. And so as I felt it, every time I tried to go away from it, I couldn't. It was something that woke me up in the morning. It was something I would think about when I would go to bed at night. And everything, when I thought about my future, I could only see my future in Hollywood. So I began to believe that that was absolutely part of my calling. Mm -hmm. So in order to answer the call, I actually had to put some works behind my faith, which was go to Hollywood, commit to the process, learn, invest, sacrifice. And as I did it along the way, I got confirmation. I believe that anybody that's called, you have to hear it. And once you hear it, you have to then go into action. You have to put yourself in a situation where you can get confirmation of whether or not what you believe you have heard is absolutely true. You can't just do it again intellectually. You can't just say, oh, I'm called. Let me see how I feel. No, you got to go and say, OK, I'm called to this industry. Let me dip my toe in it. And as I dip my toe in it, I'm going to get confirmation if that is truly my calling. And for me, as I've been in entertainment for 20 years, that calling of entertainment was absolutely true. But then also this calling of inspiration, writing books, you know, speaking, using entertainment as a platform for empowerment and using all aspects of entertainment to empower people. The calling wasn't just one calling. It was a calling that has evolved the longer and the more that I pursued the initial thing that brought me into Hollywood. Well, what you said strikes me in talking about calling. Sometimes calling seems to be uh, interchangeable with the, with the term purpose or why, but I like how you say literally when you try to think of others, when you try to move away from that it was this this ambition that literally called you back. Like it was calling, it was pulling like a siren almost to you. <laughs> yes, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it, it, it is. And the thing about the call is that there's, the, the call continues. And, there, and it's like, the more, once you get into your main call, right, with, you know, then you start to hear other calls. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you have different ringtones for different areas <laughs> of your purpose, right? Yeah. And so even now there are certain things that I hear, like even writing this book, that was a call. And I was like, oh, you know, I just got off of writing my, my book with my wife, the Wade, and, and I was focused on, you know, doing some film stuff, but I heard the call, you got to write this book. And so I had to answer it. And so it's interesting that as you hear these different rings, don't be afraid to answer because when you answer the thing that you really want, which is peace and success is on the other side of the line. Once you pick up. 
I like the ringtones. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go through some of the commandments and lessons that that you've learned through the years that you share in the book. So the first commandment is your prayers alone aren't enough. So your wife experienced this firsthand, I believe, as, as she sought to make some changes in her career direction. So tell us about the meaning of the commandment and how it, it helped guide your wife recently. Yes. Um, you know, I, I love this uh, commandment because, you know, the, the whole idea is that, you know, your prayers aren't enough, which means you have to pray and you have to get up and prepare for what you were praying for. Uh, so my wife, you know, Megan Good, she's an actress and has been around in, in Hollywood and acting since she was the at the age of four. So she's been doing it for a long time. And her dream was to be in an action film or an action show. And every night, you know, when I would come home from work, I would see her on the couch. Uh, she would be eating something and watching television. And I would ask her, hey, did you go work out today? And she was like, no, I didn't work out. And then days would pass. I would say, hey, did you work out today? No, I didn't work out. And then she would complain about, you know, I'm not getting consideration for this action movie. And I went in for the audition for these different films and no one's calling me back. And so one night I said, babe, I said, you keep complaining. But I said, you're not preparing for what you're praying for. I said, part of things that manifest happen when you begin to put in action something even before the opportunity presents itself. I said, you got to meet God more than halfway. If you're serious about being an action star, then you have to live an action star lifestyle. And I said, and action stars don't sit up on the couch, you know, and, and watch TV most of the day. They're out in the gym working on their body because their body is their calling card. So she received it and, you know, she said, okay. And the next thing you know, she started going to the gym day after day after day. So much so she started loving it, got mm. addicted to it. So much so that there was a project that we we like, we ended up bringing to her, um, a producer, a friend of mine and myself, uh, an MGM called Foxy Brown, which is an old 70s film. Yeah. And so, you know, she had talked to that producer and said, hey, I'd love to do it. And then the producer came to me. Long story short, MGM and Hulu said, yes, we will develop this as a vehicle for you. And it will be the first action vehicle that she has done in her career. And so I tell that anecdote to say it really does work. When you begin to prepare for what you prayed for, you then begin to put things in motion in terms of manifesting what you want. You can't just sit up there and say, oh, God, bring it to me. No, faith without works is dead. But faith with works is alive. Why do you think then people do just rely on the prayer and just just believing that it's going to happen, willing it to happen almost? Why do, why do yeah. you think that happens? Uh, I think two reasons. I think I think conditioning and I think fear. I think that, you know, a lot of times, you know, when you are taught to pray and when you grow up in a community of faith, there is a conditioning sometimes that that makes you think that prayer is all you need to do. Mm -hmm. And and also what I have found is that it is really hard to inspire somebody in their dream if you've given up on yours. And there are a lot of people, you know, in communities of faith that have given up on their dreams for whatever reason. And so a lot of the teaching isn't like, okay, hey, you got to pray and prepare. So part of it's conditioning. And so you have to rework your mental conditioning to know that you have to be an active participant in finding success in your life that goes alongside the very things you're praying for God to do. The second thing is fear. No matter where you are, Fear is something that is a virus that can corrupt your destiny, your calling, and your success. And that fear factor, it, it can manifest in, okay, I'm praying about it, so that means I'm being active, but if it doesn't happen, that means, oh, it must not have been God's will. No, the truth of the matter is you were too afraid to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation to really see what God's will was. So those are the two reasons that I see so many people just rely on prayer in the absence of active action that puts them on a path to discover whether or not they are meant to do the very thing that they are pursuing right at this moment. So I want to skip to the third commandment in the book, and that's you have to carry a crown before you can wear one. Now, I'm, I'm certain that most people would rather wear the crown, but <laughs> explain this commandment and what the crown actually symbolizes. Uh, you know, the crown symbolizes authority. A crown symbolizes the the place that we are aspiring to be, where we are in a position of success. We do have a measure of authority. We do have a measure of autonomy. And that position looks like the very thing that we see in our vision and the thing that we see in our dreams. Now, the reason why I wrote this commandment, because I think that this is the missing link between people who have a dream and those who actually achieve it. Too often, we we want the crown. We want the authority. 
We want the position, but we don't want to commit to the process. Mm -hmm. I have not seen anyone who's had long-term success that hasn't helped somebody else become successful first. So this idea is that if you want the crown, then you have to look at who am I helping carry their crown now? In my life, you know, I helped Will Smith. You know, for 18, you know, I was I started at 18. And then when I became an executive for 10 years, you know, behind the scenes, working on his films, whatever he needed, serving, 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 learning. Uh, T.D. Jakes, is, is, you know, who I know is, uh, you know, a big fan and a, and a friend of, of, of your brand. You know, I was the executive working on all his films at Sony behind the scenes serving. Hey, Bishop, what do you need? Let's do these movies. Let's do Not Easily Broken. Let's do Miracles from Heaven. Let's do Heaven is for Real. Let's do Sparkle. Let's do Jumping the Broom. Serving, serving, serving. I had my own dreams, but I had to help serve those who had the crown achieve their dreams first. And as part of that process, I learned preparation. I learned strategy. I learned how to deal with people. I grew in my calling. I gained a greater competency. And so now as things are beginning to manifest in my life and I'm beginning to achieve some of the things I've been dreaming about, it has all come because I committed to service. I committed to help someone do what they were called to do. And in return, I got the preparation needed to do what I was called to do one day. So... I'm thinking from the the listener standpoint, like, I mean, for example, like I am a person of faith and and I believe in in serving others and helping others, but also in a competitive business environment, the realism sometimes is that the more you help people, the more you you lift other people up, sometimes you get taken advantage of. Sometimes you get walked mm-hmm. over. How do you deal with that? You know, this is a great question. I love it. Uh, You know, I think that what happens is that you have to always do a cost benefit analysis. So when and, and you also have to keep a service mentality, if you have a service mentality, even when I was an executive, even now as a producer, I'm always thinking, okay, who can I service and how can I service them well? This service mentality will always put you on the hunt to add value wherever you are. Now, here's what happens. You got to do a cost benefit analysis. And what I mean by that is that if you're in an opportunity and you're serving, if the benefit of what you're getting out of the position is greater than what it's costing you, then that means you need to stay, stick it out, and continue to learn. But the moment that opportunity begins to cost you more than you're getting out of it, that's when you know it's time to make a move. There have been plenty of times in my career where I was in service and people took uh, credit for things I may have done or ideas I may have had. But here's what I know. If I am gifted and and totally called to this industry, one idea does not define my whole career. And every time I felt like I was being overshadowed or maybe sometimes being taken advantage of, I would do this cost-benefit analysis. And I would realize there is still more benefit to the position than what it's costing me. And as I stuck it out and as I continued to learn, when it was time to move and it began to cost me more and I made the move, I actually was better prepared to make the move because of the time of service that I had put in. So I go into any job and I would encourage you in any job you're going into, don't worry initially about, oh, am I going to be taken advantage of? Commit yourself, throw yourself into the process, throw yourself into the job because through that 100% commitment, you will get out of it what you need, which is experience, expertise, opportunity, and information. Devon, tell me about the time that you decided that it was time to break out on your own. And and nervously you walked into that executive's office and you <laughs> you told her what? Yes. Um, you know, uh, the dream that I always had was to start my own production company. And so, you know, I started at 18 years old and it, it was about 6,500 days, 150,000 hours <laughs> that took me to this meeting. OK, which was me going into the chairman's office of Sony at the time. It was Amy Pascal. Uh, she just produced the latest Spider-Man movie. And I went in to Amy's office. It was two days after the film that I oversaw as an executive. Heaven is for real had come out. In the first five days, it made $30 million. And I was emailing with Amy over that weekend. And I said, hey, can I come see you? She said, yes. I went in and saw her on Tuesday after Heaven is For Real opened. And she was like, great. You know, you're. what do you want to do? We'll promote you. What do you want? And I said, I got to quit. 
I said, it's time for me to go. And she's like, what do you mean? It's like, I said, it's time for me to start my own production company. I can't continue to create value for the company that I can't participate in. And I want you to give me a deal. You know, and she looked at me, you know, a little bit and she said, okay, I'll do it. Because for me, again, going back to the cost benefit analysis, I realized at that moment, if I stayed any longer as the executive, it would have cost me more than I would have gotten out of it. And there, in when you have equity as an executive, you have to know what you want to use it for. And for me, I didn't want to take that equity and reinvest it in a higher executive position. I wanted to take that equity and, re- and, and invest it into my freedom, which was to do the thing I had always wanted to do, which was to have my own company and produce my own content. And what was so fascinating about that moment when she said yes, it took us months and months to negotiate the deal. By the time the deal was done, soon thereafter, the, the hack hit where all the Sony Pictures mm-hmm. Entertainment computers were yeah. hacked by North Korea. And out of that catastrophe, Amy ended up losing her job. And what was fascinating is that if I would have waited, I may not be here talking to you right now. I may not have my company. I may not be in this level of that things are going on. So it's so important, you know, going back to the call, when you hear that ring, You got to answer. You got to go. You got to move because you don't know how long things will be in position that will help you become successful. And if you misjudge timing, you may miss what you've been dreaming and pursuing all the way along. So one of the last things I want to touch on is how you highlight the power that our differences can give us. So why is that something that we should do no matter what our profession or, or, or career or goals are? Like, how does that help us personally and professionally? Yeah, in in, uh, in the Hollywood commandments, uh, this is one of the, the commandments, you know, your difference is your destiny. And I deeply believe in this. I deeply believe that there's too much of a pressure, uh, you know, on so many of us to conform to others' ideals of who we, who they want us to be or who they think we should be instead of us just owning who we are. And when I look at the world and I look at those who made an impact on the world, they were not the people that conformed to a societal norm or, or or a communal norm. They were people that owned their difference and they used that difference to make the deepest, greatest impact in the world. And so I really believe that when you own what makes you different, you know, when you own what makes you think different, look different, feel different, uh, when you say, you know what, I may be the only person in my family that wants to pursue this industry and I'm going to go for it, even though there's no one in my family that's done it. Even though there's no one in my family that's completed their degree, I'm going to go complete my degree and I'm going to go, you know, get in this industry. That difference and the thing that makes you unique and the thing that makes you stand out is going to be the key to your success. When you are in an environment, especially when you're in a corporate environment, you're working alongside other executives. When your boss sits around and identifies who on their staff they need, anyone that's interchangeable are not the people that get the promotion usually. It's the person that sticks out. It's the person that says, you know what? We don't have another one of them in the company. We need to keep them. We need to promote them. We need to nurture them. So I do believe that that owning your difference is the key to achieving your destiny. And I think it's important to not fear the discovery of what your difference will bring. Uh, so many times, you know, my difference of like, you know, being, uh, you know, a Christian and pursuing Hollywood. Okay. That's different. And that was painful at times because my community of faith didn't always embrace me. And then, you know, in Hollywood, I'm the only one, you know, in certain times, certain meetings, you know, talking about God or talking about faith. And, you know, again, they didn't put me out the room, but sometimes they would just look at me and I'd be like, oh, okay, well, (laughs) so, um, but, but, but again, owning that difference, um, is what has helped me be here. What has helped me, you know, have a company and to be able to write books about this specific topic, because that difference is what has changed everything. And so I wanted to write this commandment to inspire and to empower people to own their difference. Please don't sand down the edges of your difference. Keep your difference sharp, because that's what's going to help you cut through to find the success that you have been dreaming about. Beautifully put. So, Devon, I really do appreciate the time that uh, you've you've spent with us. Before I let you go, we've got a few questions that we like to ask everyone here on Success Talk. So, you ready? I am ready. All right. What's the best piece of advice that anyone's ever given you? Oh, wow. 
You know, I, I would say, uh, you know, something that always resonates in my in my head. I know you said a piece. I'm going to give you two pieces. Uh, one, the first piece is from uh, Will. Will Smith always told me, he said, you know, it's not, um, he said, success is not like, like the first nine yards, right, is, is, is easy. But it's that last inch that is the hardest. And so don't mistake that last inch before you have the success you want as being the easiest time. It's usually the hardest time. And as I've thought about that advice, it really has made my life true because I'm like, man, there have been moments when I'm like, okay, I thought I should be there by now. But then I remember, wait a minute, before you hit the summit, it's always the steepest. So I love that piece of advice, which has helped me. The other thing my Aunt Donna told me is never burn bridges. And you never know when you have to cross them again. And uh, in the Hollywood commandments, uh, the last commandment is your world is smaller than you think. Mm -hmm. And so I really take that advice to heart about don't burn bridges. You know, you may end a situation and you may feel justified um, to end it badly, but don't end it in peace. End it, you know, with integrity, because, again, you never know when you may have to go back. That's very true. What's the strangest or craziest thing that anyone that you've worked with has asked for or or done off are on set. <laughs> oh man. Oh wow. I mean, the the craziest story that comes to mind was when um before I was a studio executive and I was working at a production company. Uh, and at the time we were in the process of trying to do the TLC story. Um, you know, TLC, yep. you know, from back in the day, don't go chasing waterfalls. Yes. Well, yes. So I got a call <laughs> and the head of the company said, hey, you know, Left Eye, who was a member uh, of TLC, uh, may she rest in peace, mm -hmm. her sister was in town. And uh, <laughs> the, the head of the, the company said, hey, Devon, you know, could you take her sister, you know, to Universal Studios? She's never been. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I and, and I want you to take her, you know, and, and show her, you know, Universal Studios. Like and rides and everything? It would be, Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so that was what I did. I literally for the whole day went, you know, we went on rides. We did the whole thing. Oh, and I'm man. like, only in Hollywood, only in Hollywood. Yes. <laughs> so that, that, that was a pretty crazy story. And, you know, she's cool. And, uh, you know, we definitely became friends and all that, but I thought, oh, wow. So this, this is totally different. Yeah. All right. What's the thing that you love the absolute most about working in the entertainment industry? You know, the freedom, freedom, the imagination, uh, being in entertainment, it's like I can come up with an idea and I can put that idea together and then you can see that idea come to life. And that is what I love about entertainment. It really is the place where dreams can come true. You can take something that's black and white on a page and then you can watch everybody in, in a theater, you know, see it come to life and see them cry and see them laugh and, and see them applaud. I mean, that is the thing I love most about taking something and making it into something that can really be eternal. You know, films and television, they're eternal, right? They're always going to be here. And so I love that idea of being able to take something uh, or nothing, you know, and make it into something and use the power of imagination as a way to do that. And finally, how do you define success? I define success as peace. Uh, I believe that when you can, you know, wake up in the morning and feel peace, you can when you can like who looks back at you in the mirror, uh, when you can go to bed and feel good about who you are and where you're going, I believe you are successful. Uh, I think that too often we define success uh, from an outward, external point of view, but I, le but I believe real success can only be defined internally by the peace that you have. I know so many people who have all the things external, you know, great amounts of money, incredible position, not happy not peaceful. I know people who may not have as much money, but have that peace. I believe that real success is peace. And I can, I believe it only can be found when you really pursue what is in your heart and do it with faith, do it with prayer and do it with preparation that you can only get from working in your industry. Thanks so much, Devon, for, for joining us. Thank you so much, Shelby, for having me. Hey, success listeners, Josh Ellis here, editor-in-chief of the magazine. What a great talk between Shelby and Devin. Devin has accomplished so much toward living his passion and what truly matters to him. He has certainly learned a lot on his journey. His differences, his passion for maintaining his values and beliefs, even in the face of situations 
that would test them greatly is what he sees as the reason for his success. And he encourages you as well to see your differences as the assets that make you unique. Difference is destiny, according to Devin. It certainly was for him. So remember, your uniqueness is what helps you find and live your calling. A personal calling, that's another thing Devin believes in. For him, well, he learned his calling at a young age, and from that point on, he got going. He took action to confirm it and live it. He didn't wait. Waiting would have meant that he could have missed out on what he'd been dreaming of and pursuing. So be vigilant and ready, because you don't want to miss out on the moment when your calling can become something more if you'd only listened. And then finally, I want to point out where Shelby and Devin discuss being in a place of authority and respect. Getting there is a slippery slope, but Devin has a surefire method for it. Service. Sound familiar? Our columnist and the success ambassador, leadership expert John C. Maxwell, talks about service often, as do so many others. Leadership, power, authority, they all come from serving and helping others first, with their role as a leader or person in power. By staying humble and serving, you'll be learning, growing, and gaining invaluable knowledge, lessons, and respect that will help you later when you are in a place of authority yourself. And even then, coming from a spirit of service is what will make you a great leader and a mover and shaker, no matter your call. Welcome, success listeners. Shelby Skirhawk here, director of digital content for success.com and co-host of the podcast, Success Insider. As a fan and enthusiast of high-performance cars, I love using automotive analogies ever so often. So... If you're having an off day, you might say your body or mind isn't firing on all cylinders. That's because your mind is an engine running your vehicle, right? But is it possible to tune the engine of your mind to perform at its very peak condition nearly all the time? Brad Stolberg, who authored Peak Performance, Elevate Your Game, Avoid Burnout, and Thrive with the New Science of Success with Steve Magnus has made a study of what it takes to perform at the very top of our game, day in and day out. Brad writes about health and the science of human performance. He's a columnist for Outside Magazine, and as an avid athlete, he takes a unique perspective on performance that can be applied to any discipline. Brad, thanks so much for joining us to help us up our performance today. Thanks for having me. So let's go ahead and dive right in then. So it seems there's a lot of societal pressure for everyone to perform at their peak nonstop. So where is this pressure coming from? I think it's coming from all over, um, in ourselves included. Probably more so than anywhere, though, is digital technology. It's easier than ever to be online all the time and to feel like you have to be working. And if you're not working, someone else is. So I think that these technologies that ironically were supposed to help with work-life balance by allowing us to work remotely have almost had the opposite effect and and place this immense pressure to constantly be online and on top of our game. And being online without regard to when we work best, when when it's it's most conducive for the most productive performance. It's it's just 24-7, it seems like, right? Exactly. So then is nonstop peak performance, you know, performing at this very top level all the time, is that even possible? I mean, with with pressure for top performance growing seemingly exponentially, aren't we at risk for, for burnout trying to attain that top performance? Yeah, I think so. And and the data supports that. Um, Depending on the field, surveys show that anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of Americans are feeling burnt out. And that's true whether you look at elite athletes or physicians or teachers or artists. So it it, it really is true and and, and evidenced by the data that I think that this pressure is resulting in a lot of people um, just working themselves to the ground. So then when you're talking about peak performance, then what exactly are we meaning? I mean, it's obviously different uh, based on the task at hand, but what does it look like for most people across the board? The way that I like to define it is feeling like you're on top of your game 
and performing at your personal best and doing so in a way that you feel good while doing it and that is sustainable over a long haul. So then in your your studies of peak performance, you looked at some of the common underlying principles, um, some of the things that factor into what the best athletes do, what the best performers do. And so one common practice that you came across was the concept of alternating stress and rest. We explain this and why is it key? Yeah. So this was fascinating because like you said, this was a principle that cut across the board, whether I was speaking with world-class visual artists, musicians, um, athletes, or, or even entrepreneurs. And the underlying theme was they kept their hard sessions and their hard periods of intense work very hard, and then their easy periods very easy. And the analogy that I like to give is, is born out of exercise science. So if you think about your bicep muscle on your arm, if you want to make your bicep stronger, you have to pick up a weight that challenges your bicep but doesn't completely overwhelm it, lift that weight, and then recover so your body can adapt. If you pick up a weight that is way too heavy, odds are you're gonna injure yourself. You'll throw out your back, you'll tear your bicep tendon. If you pick up a weight that's too light, you could sit there all day and curl a one pound weight and your muscle won't grow. So the key to making your bicep muscle or really any muscle grow is to find a stressor, and we'll talk more about that in a bit, that challenges it, stress the muscle almost to the point of failure, and then let it recover. And what's fascinating is it turns out that the brain in, in cognitive processes grow and perform in a very similar fashion. Explain a little bit more of that for us. Yeah, so we like to think that our minds are functioning at their top of their game and working while we're, we're actually doing our work. So for me, as a writer, that might be while researching or, or even while writing. But science tells a very different story. Our brains store, consolidate, connect information, not when we're sitting at the, the computer working, but rather when we're resting, um, more than anything when we're sleeping. Same thing for creativity. We're most likely to have a creative thought or an aha moment of insight, not when we're deep in the work, but when we step away from the work. Uh, an anecdote that, that almost everyone has experienced is having like a eureka moment in the shower, or perhaps on a walk. And that's a prime example of having this moment of insight and being able to solve a problem that you weren't able to solve when you were in the midst of the work, only when you step away from it. Is there scientific reasoning why that happens, why we tend to get our best aha moments when, when we are not focused in the work, but rather doing something else? Yeah, there is. So what the researchers speculate is that there's a, a, a subtle difference between our conscious and our subconscious mind. And our conscious mind is, is involved in effortful thinking. So that's if you're a mathematician when you're at the whiteboard doing math. Or if you're a writer, it's when you're at the computer trying to put together a sentence. Often, creative breakthroughs, um, and I guess I would define that as solving problems that are, are very tricky to solve, they don't occur thanks to that conscious effortful mind. It's only when the subconscious mind has the chance to kind of come online that we have those breakthrough insights. And sure enough, the subconscious mind and the conscious mind, it's almost a zero sum game. They kind of fight for space. So if you're effortfully doing something, you don't really have access to that more creative part of your brain. It's only when you stop effortful thinking, again, rest and check out that you do access your subconscious mind. Are there any exceptions to this rule when uh, when you are in that in that zone, when you hit that kind of uh, moment of flow where you are very much in the work, but you can still attain that uh, that that creative moment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think that if you're deep in the zone and you're thriving and you're working, I would I would very rarely tell anyone to stop. <laughs> I think that when this matters most is almost when you're stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the impulse can be when you're stuck on a hard problem is to sit there and work it to death. When in fact, there's all kinds of research that shows that stepping away is, is your best bet. But it takes guts to step away. Uh, as a personal example, as a writer, there are times when I have a deadline of 10 a.m. the next morning, and it's 8 p.m., and I just can't figure out how I'm going to write the intro to a story. And it takes a lot of guts to go to sleep and just kind of trust that when you wake up, you'll be fresh and you'll have insight that you didn't have the night before. That is a huge trust because as, as maybe a late owl uh, might attest to, like me, 
I know that I'm probably not going to be at my peak performance in the morning. And so I'm just going to make myself power through. So what about those types of people that that know kind of when they work best and when they don't? And, and how can they use this principle of stress and rest to, uh, to help a breakthrough? Oh, that's such a good question. I use myself as an example, and um, I'm a morning person. So for me, I try to stack my deep focus work or what, what we might call stress for the early mornings. If you know that you're a night owl and you tend to really get in the zone in the evening, you might want to do the reverse and have your periods of deep focus work in the evening and try to design your day so your rest periods can be in the morning or when you don't feel like you're in the zone. So it's really trying to match your activities to your energy levels. Stress when you feel like you have the energy to do so, but then have the guts to walk away and rest during off-peak times. All right, so then let's dive into a little bit more about the type of stress that you're talking about, because of course you're not talking about this cultural definition of stress, but but rather, um, like you said, stacking your work, stacking the the um, the most important things, maybe the the pending deadlines. Uh, Explain a little bit more about what this this stress is that you're talking about. So when I talk about stress, you're right. It's it's not how we might traditionally view stress, like a, a, a fight with your significant other or feeling like you have to do a million things at once or um, you know getting into a spat with your boss at work. Uh, I'm, I'm using stress much more in biological terms, so as some sort of uh, stimulus to the brain or the body. Um, that stimulus can, again, be like that analogy for the body lifting a weight, but for the mind, it can be doing, um, a very intense period of work. And so the rest then that we're talking about, uh, what are some examples of rest? So rest depends on what the stress is. So for a psychologically demanding task, one of the best ways to rest is actually to do something physically because that allows your brain to to check out and and you have access to your subconscious mind and you can recover. Whereas if you're a professional athlete and you're constantly stressing your your body and and applying a stimulus to your body, rest might be doing something cognitively engaging. So it's really um, just a broad term for switching to a task that's very separate from what you're working on. Now, the one exception to that is sleep. Sleep is just absolutely integral to whether you're trying to perform with your mind or your body, Um, and and that counts as rest for just about anyone. So then is that to say then those that are sleep-deprived, some that aren't uh, putting sleep as a a priority, that's really limiting their, their potential to perform, correct? Correct. Sleep is one of the most productive things that you can do. Um, I, that's a drum that I will be over and over again. I think culturally it's starting to shift, but I still think that lots of people put off sleep thinking they'll be able to get more done if they don't sleep. When in fact, the answer is so often the opposite, that sleep is the conduit to being able to produce a high volume of work and high quality work. That's interesting how you do um, juxtapose the different types of stress and rest. So if the stress is a bodily stress, then it's best to to shift to more of a cerebral task as a rest versus if you are head down into a project and trying to problem solve something instead of thinking of rest as, well, I'm just going to shift to this other project that's easy kind of kind of mind numbing, but it's it's easy work. That's not necessarily the the best rest you're talking about. If anything, it's what you're saying is best to get up and, and move around, right? Exactly. One of my favorite studies that um, I reported on for the book was out of Stanford University, and it uh, was aptly titled, Give Your Ideas Some Legs. And what they did is they had a group of individuals um, work quite hard on a cognitive task, so using using their minds, something cerebral. Then they had one group take a break just by sitting indoors. In another group, they took a break by walking outside. So again, doing something physically. And after the break, they had both groups come back and they ran a battery of tests of creativity and insight. In the group that walked outside, they were something like 40% more creative than the indoor group. And what's so interesting to me is, yes, this modern science is enlightening and it's rigorously controlled and done out of places like Stanford, but we've known this for ages. I mean, almost all great writers, 
the Thoreau, um, you know, countless philosophers, right? I think Thoreau said, me thinks best when my legs are moving. So this notion of, of switching and particularly doing something physically, it's an age old concept and only now is modern science proving it. So another aspect then of peak performance that you explore is routine. So how does routine affect performance? And, and will you share some pointers for maximizing our routine or, or finding ways to put routine into our lives? Yeah, so routine across the board is a, is a performance uh, enhancer, no doubt about it. Now, what's really interesting is while every individual has a right routine that works for him or her, there is no single routine that works across the population. So anyone that tells you, I've got the perfect routine, you just have to wake up at this hour, have this type of coffee or tea, do this specific exercise, don't buy into that because it's just not true. So then the question becomes, like you said, how does one develop a routine that works for them? And it's something that you alluded to earlier. I think the first thing that's just really important is to do some reflection on when you feel like you're at your best and when your energy levels are highest. And to the extent that you can, do what you can to pair work to those time periods. So rather than letting the day control you, try to control the day. So if you know that you're a night owl, do everything that you can to schedule your most deep focused work for evenings. Um, Flip side, if you're a morning person. Uh, another very practical tip around developing routine is, um, you know, s- similarly to what we were just discussing with, with making things automated and automatic, to the extent that you can, if there are things that you feel like you're thinking about um, or, or you're kind of ruminating over, try to just make them automatic so you don't even have to think about them. Because uh, what a routine does is it, it gets you to what matters most with expending as little energy possible getting there. And it also makes you comfortable once you've arrived because you've gone through the same set of things beforehand. For the book, you studied a lot of athletes and top performers' routines. Uh, You say that they are are all unique and and one that works for one doesn't necessarily work for another. But what were some of the more interesting routines that you came across? So uh, this might be my favorite part of the book. I'm so glad you asked this question. So there's this notion of turning anxiety into excitement that I just love. And it goes like this. So before a big event, so for an athlete, it might be a competition. Um, For someone in a more traditional work setting, it it might be making a big presentation or public speaking. The conventional wisdom is to try to get yourself to calm down, right? If you're feeling nerves before public speaking, just take some deep breaths, calm down. It turns out that's not always the best approach because when you tell yourself to calm down, you're actually signaling that something is wrong. So unless you're deeply trained in meditation and you know that you can take those deep breaths and they will in fact calm you down, what often happens is you try to take those deep breaths, they don't actually calm you down, and now you're even more nervous. So what the latest research shows is that rather than trying to force yourself to calm down, again, which signals something's wrong, you should try to reappraise those sensations that you're feeling that you might have normally appraised as being anxious. So a raising heart rate increase in body temperature, maybe even butterflies in your stomach. And instead of trying to force those away, you should tell yourself, this is my body getting ready to go. So I'm not anxious, I'm excited. And I'm gonna have my full perception honed in on the task at hand. And just by having that subtle shift in mindset, you can drastically increase your performance. This has been something that has been studied in the literature, and it's also something that was very common to a lot of top athletes, which is before events, they don't try to calm down. They take all those emotions that they're feeling and they channel them towards the task at hand um, via getting excited. Well, that's something interesting that I'd never thought about before. Um, You know, here on Success Talks, uh, we've actually spoken to um, a woman named Mel Robbins who, um, who had learn to beat back her anxiety, or I guess that's not even the right term, beating back anxiety, because instead what she did is is reframe it and say, okay, I am feeling nervous. I've got the butterflies. I'm, you know, I'm starting to sweat. Why am I feeling this way? And reframe it as excitement. Well, I'm feeling this way because I'm excited about this coming up and trying to uh, to take out the connotation of that, well, something must be wrong, you know, you know, and start that kind of bio... Uh, biological, oh, I guess, domino effect that happens when anxiety starts to take take hold. But that's an interesting point you make about athletes because 
that's true. Athletes surely have the same anxieties that we all have, but the last thing an athlete would want to do is pop a Xanax before the going out for the big game. So they have to be able to channel that anxiety. Yeah, completely. Um, and I mean, th- there are, of course, there are always exceptions in context matters. So if you're a professional golfer and you're lining up to make a putt on the green, mm-hmm. you probably don't want your heart going in a million <laughs> miles an hour. Right. But I think most professional golfers are trained in relaxation techniques. So if you're trained in them and you can really use them, great, do so. But for the vast majority of us, we aren't trained in them, and it might not even be so beneficial. So what ultimately comes after we reach peak performance? How do we continue to make sure that we are repeating this and able to consistently hit that peak performance when we need it most? So I think there there are two things. The first is have the courage to rest. Know that for the long haul, stepping away is going to make you better. Uh, I can't say that enough times because it does run counter to the common culture, but I think it's really important. The second is kind of the opposite, which is also, if you do rest, have the guts to really stress yourself. So in the book, we call it the growth equation. Stress plus rest equals growth. And not only is it helpful to think about managing a day, a week, or a year using that equation, but also an entire career. So are you constantly stressing yourself? Are you constantly taking on projects and challenges that are ever so slightly outside of your comfort zone, and then giving yourself time to reflect on them and to recover from them. Um, So, you know, in in sports, it's called periodization, or it's this notion that you constantly want to grow and build by repeating the cycle of stress plus rest. And I think it holds true off the playing field as well. And and not just even professionally. I mean, you can think about um, evolving in a relationship by taking on greater challenges together and then reflecting on them, kind of quote unquote recovering from them, which then gives you the capacity to take on even greater challenges. So it's a, it's a really nice principle um, that I think puts people on a good trajectory to, to attain peak performance and to keep on growing. Brad, something you mentioned at the beginning about um, making your hard work very hard and make your easy rest very easy. Um, but that the idea of that stressing something, stressing a muscle in this case, um, almost to the point of failure. How does that apply then in those work tasks that maybe are too much for us? How do we recognize that? It's a wonderful question. So I would say that you want to be well above boredom or going through the motions. So if you feel like you're bored or you're just going through the motions, you're, you're probably not growing. Now, the flip side is if you feel utterly anxious, and you can try to re- reappraise that anxiety as excitement as best as you can, but you just know that you're over your, you know, you are in over your head, that's probably too great of a challenge. So what I like to recommend is trying to take on a few projects that don't make you anxious, but that you're a little bit uncertain about. So maybe you're not quite sure you've got it completely in the bag, but, but, but you think you've got a shot. And that's very similar to selecting a weight in the weight room that's going to challenge you. Excellent points. So, Brad, I'm, I'm really glad you joined us today. Um, I, f- I feel like I'm, I'm going to perform a little better after uh, this time with you. But before I let you go, I've got a few more questions we like to ask everyone here on Success Talks. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So what book changed your life or perspective and why? So there is a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance um, by an author named Robert Persig. And I've read that book about five times now, um, and it's completely changed my life. So in the book, Persig introduces this notion of quality uh, with a capital Q. And for him, quality means being fully present and caring deeply about what you're doing. And um, it's just completely changed the way that I work and and, and that I approach my relationships and really just try to create as much quality with a capital Q in my life as I can. What's the best piece of advice anyone has ever given you? Ooh, this is tough. Um, you know, recently, a, a mentor of mine named Adam Grant, who's uh, a psychologist at uh, Wharton Business School and has written a, a bunch of wonderful books. The originals, um, yeah. We had a conversation a- about resilience. And Adam told me to make sure that I allow myself to experience joy. And what he means by that is a lot of driven people push, 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 push. 
and they're constantly choosing activities that they think are challenging. It's all the things that we just discussed and meaningful and in, in, in just manageable challenges, but they don't necessarily give themselves time to just be happy and watch cat videos and goof off. And that's one of the most important things that you can do to become more resilient because eventually stuff's going to hit the fan. And when stuff goes bad, you have to know how to find joy. Otherwise, you're really in trouble. That's a great point. What's the biggest change that you've ever made in your life that really turned things around for you? It's another good question. Um, you know, I think transitioning more of my time into writing professionally. So I didn't go into journalism school. Um, I wasn't on a path to become a professional writer. I was a corporate consultant at McKinsey and Company. And um, over time, I identified communication as something that I really liked and, and was told I had some potential in it. Um, and I shifted my trajectory, I guess, from, from that of a corporate consultant to a professional writer. Um, I didn't leap in completely. Uh, it, it was a very incremental process. So it wasn't like this kind of heroic decision that suddenly changed my life. But I think it was a, a trajectory change um, that, that clearly has changed my life. And finally, Brad, how do you define success? It's a tough one, but I think contentment, right? We've just spent a lot of time talking about pushing and constantly getting the most out of ourselves. But I think ultimate success is just being content and, and being truly fulfilled and happy with where you are. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much, Brad. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hey there, Josh Ellis, Editor-in-Chief of Success Magazine, joining you here. I gotta say, I never would have thought I'd believe it if someone told me that stress is a good thing. But Brad has a unique way of looking at stress that is different from what our cultural view of stress is. Stress, at least in regards to how Brad talks about it, is a stimulus to the body. It isn't that feeling of being overwhelmed with too much to do. Stress is actually your everyday work and actions. It's what you do day in and day out that you want to improve upon. And more important, stress is the opposite of rest. I know what you're thinking. Well, of course it is, Josh. Who doesn't know that? But the thing that is important to know is why stress and rest being opposites is a key part of your performance. According to Stolberg's research, stress plus rest equals growth. You have to have both in order to develop those high-performance habits that make you part of the elite group of successful people out there. For those operating at peak performance levels, it is all about challenging yourself to a point where you can still handle it, but you're right on the edge, and then having the courage to back down and rest. This puts your brain to the test the same way you would a muscle in the gym. And it's in the balance and routine of stress and rest that you find growth and insight too. Because it is in those times of rest that people most frequently experience their aha moments when the light bulb turns on and you get the answer to the question you've been trying to figure out, or you come up with a new brilliant idea that will change the world, or at least your corner of it to start off with. So what does all this amount to? We now know stress is good, but better when coupled with rest. So take that idea and find a routine that works for you. Don't subscribe to someone else's plan of how much sleep and work you should get in daily and what type of rest to get. You and your body and mind need something different than me or Shelby or your significant other or anyone. You need to discover that process, routine, and those habits that will put you at peak performance and keep you there if you are consistent with it. What are you waiting for? Go stress or rest, whichever you're ready for right now. Welcome, Success listeners. Shelby Skirhawk here, Director of Digital Content for Success.com and co-host of the podcast, Success Insider. When you think of a high-performance achiever, the charismatic, gregarious, outgoing types like Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, or those Silicon Valley serial entrepreneurs come to mind. But high-performance, highly motivated achievers come in all different personality types. Some are soft-spoken, some are slow to seek the spotlight, some are paradoxically low energy, and some are hiding in the bathroom. Our guest today, Maura Ahrens Mealy, says her introvertedness is so often at odds with her addiction to achievement. 
that the solace of the ladies' room is a mental health strategy. Moore is the founder of the social impact agency Women Online and author of Hiding in the Bathroom, an introvert's roadmap for getting out there when you'd rather stay home. She's refreshingly honest about the challenges she faces with anxiety, medication, and the pressure that society puts on us to always lean in, press the flesh, network, and climb the ladder, when sometimes your best success strategy is letting yourself off the hook for all these things. Maura, you're speaking my language. Thanks for joining me here on Success Talks. Oh, thank you, Shelby. So Maura, you were on the fast track as a young, successful executive running marketing for Europe's largest online travel company uh, when you were 25. And, and you know, you were recognized uh, as a 30 under 30. You were a high-performing, high-profile professional. But the problem was that you were secretly miserable. So Maura, will you describe what you were going through then? You know, I'm not sure I was so secretly miserable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's very funny. And, and I'm sure you and a lot of our, our listeners can relate. It never occurred to me to not go for it. I, I had always gone for it at school, in sports. And then when it came to my jobs too, you know, of course I had to go for the, the biggest job. Of course I had to go for the promotion. And because I had the good fortune of growing up, you know, in the boom, boom Clinton era, it was very easy to get a job. Um, it, it wasn't that hard for me actually to get increasingly bigger jobs. And then after I had quit, I think my 10th job when I was 29 years old, it occurred to me that something was seriously wrong because at each one of those jobs, I would get sad, I would get depressed, and I'd find myself crying in the ladies' room a lot more. And then I'd leave, hoping that things would change, and they never did. So just before I turned 30, I thought, I got to change my life. And I went to graduate school. I thought that changing what I did for work would make me happy, would make me feel better. And it turns out I learned along the way, it wasn't actually what I did for work. It was how I did it and the pressures I put on myself while doing it. Well, so a lot of those those feelings that that you describe about wanting to to be the best, do the best, always go for it, but at the same time, ignoring a little bit of what's what's really happening inside and 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 all of those those clues that you say. So you know, you were finding yourself in in the bathroom crying. You were uh, in the book. You talked about how you know sometimes you're you would just get sick and you would just have to go to bed for a few days. Like <laughs> like that's the those were all of the different manifestations of, of this um, unhappiness coming out, right? Well, my low point was I broke my little toe, my pinky toe. <laughs> and I told my boss I I couldn't come into work for like a week. And I he was he was he was such a lovely man. I I you know, I was I think 26 years old at this time. And I just remember him being like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> really? Um I did I I would get sick and I would get I would get depressed. I've always struggled with anxiety and depression um, sort of periodically. And I would go through these phases at a job where I'd start feeling a depression coming on. And, you know, all I knew how to do was hide. Well, so you described those feelings that I, I've, I mean, I've gone through personally, and I know many of our, our listeners experience daily. So, In the title Mm -hmm. of the book, you say that this is an introvert's roadmap, but actually there's a couple of different behaviors that that we're talking about. You mentioned that you've always struggled with depression and anxiety. Um, So you talk about, you know, anxiety disorder, social anxiety, uh, problems with boundaries and, and, you know, saying yes to everything. So not many people really can admit to others or themselves what you've been refreshingly honest about here. So why do we hide this stuff, even though we know a lot of other people feel the same way? I know. And here we are talking about it on a podcast called Success, right? Mm-hmm. It feels It's really cool to me that we can be, you know, on this podcast about success and be having an open conversation. I think we've come a long way. I think for me, the aha moment that I could talk about all my crazy was that people resonated with it and they didn't run away from me. They actually came up and asked me questions about it. And it made me feel like I didn't have to hide anymore. You know, we chose the title, An Introvert's Roadmap, 
because I think that when you're an introvert, it doesn't necessarily mean you have anxiety or you have, you know, mental health issues. Everyone has mental health issues. <laughs> right. Let's be honest. But being an introvert and being, quote, successful in our culture are often at odds with each other. We grow up thinking that the very image of success is extroversion. It's right. get out there. It's being on 24 seven. It's just go, go, go. It's like glad handling and schmoozing. And, you know, that's really challenging if you are fundamentally and temperamentally at odds with that behavior. And I wanted to show people, not just through my own story, but through interviews and data and lots of other people's story, that you can manage your personal energy. You cannot want to be at that networking event and you can still be super, super successful. It just takes a skill set. Right. Well, I want to highlight this paragraph uh, from the book because I think it rings true for many people. You write, hiding in the bathroom had become my shorthand for hacking and faking my way to appearing like a typical successful business person. Given my natural inclinations, I would hide almost all the time, but I couldn't sustain a business that way. So I've learned to get out there, building in strategies and tricks that allay my anxieties and introversion while I'm at a professional gathering. I used to beat myself up about needing to hide in the bathroom. But over time, I've learned that I often need a moment to reset during a busy workday. Now I know it's okay to take a moment to breathe. So how does simply admitting this need to hide or retreat or take a step help you feel better about your natural inclinations? And how can we learn to work with our natural inclinations instead of suppress them or avoid them? I think the first step is to understand them and to understand what your personal boundaries are. You know, I think that a lot of people, especially when they reach a certain point in their career, they're asked to do more. And so their schedule gets really, really full and they don't have any space to reset. They don't have any space for reflection. They don't even have any space to spend an hour in the quiet. You know, because as you sort of grow in your career, again, our conflation of success with being always on, you lose that quiet time. So I think the first step is to actually say, mm, you know, this isn't working for me. Here's how I'm going to fix that. And it could be something as simple as literally going into the ladies room, you know, when you're at a, a work function or you're at a lunch or before you go on stage, you know, to go give that talk. It's really about taking the moments and not being ashamed. Uh, I have a wonderful mentor, Callie Yost, who's a, an expert on workplace strategy and workplace flexibility. And one of her recommended first steps is to put your personal time on your schedule. Don't be ashamed of it, right? If you need an hour of meeting free time to actually do your work, mm -hmm. Put that on your schedule. Have a do not bother Mora hour. You know, try if you travel a lot for business to build in that downtime. Don't be ashamed of it because it's going to help you actually do your job better. I actually think that most of us who reach a certain point in our career are pretty good at what we do and we like to do it. If we're not given the choice and the autonomy to control our day to meet our energy needs, that's not helpful. You know, I think part of it is just stepping back and owning your time. So for me, what I've realized, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I do have a lot of control over my schedule, but I also have a lot of sort of outward facing demands is I've learned to build my schedule and my week, really, I might do a week where I am in New York, you know, pitching new business, right? Because I run an agency, so I have to go see people and sell new business. So I might have a day in New York where I'm doing 10 meetings. I'm at breakfast, I'm at lunch, I'm at dinner, I'm at, you know, I'm just networking my little heart out. But the next day, I will try to have a quiet, at least half day at home in my yoga pants, talking to as few people as possible. And understanding the cadence that works for you is really, really powerful. And I promise you, it has nothing to do with how ambitious you are and really how successful you're going to be. So in the book, you say that anxiety is a gift. I've discussed this with um, a frequent guest of ours, Mel Robbins. Um, but when you're feeling that nauseous, churning, balmy feeling that <laughs> that a lot of us are familiar with. Feeling, yes. <laughs> yes. It sure doesn't feel like a gift. So 
how can we make it work for us rather than against us? Well, I, I should preface this by saying I am not a mental health professional. <laughs> Please, <laughs> I'm, I'm worried that um, I'm going to get in trouble with the medical establishment. I've had anxiety um, for over 20 years, and um, it has been a curse and a gift. And one of the things that I wanted to focus on in the book is that, A, anxiety is really normal. Again, it has nothing to do with your level of success or your level of ambition to admit that you have anxiety. And to understand that some of the things that our anxiety brings us can actually be great tools in our career. One of them is the ability to really tune in to other people and the ability to be empathetic. And I will also say that this is something that I think introverts excel at too, because we're very comfortable listening and taking in what other people around us feel. If you're in sales, if you're in a job where you have to understand the motivations of other people to get to a place where you achieve an outcome you want, Tuning in to other people and understanding how they feel is one of the biggest gifts you can get. And when you deal with anxiety, you are so used to tuning into every sensation around you, tuning into yourself, tuning into how other people relate. You can sort of understand this and use it to think when you're sitting across the table from a potential client, how does this person really feel? What are they really worried about? And how can I help solve that problem? I've interviewed a lot of managers who struggle with anxiety, and by and large, they get great reviews from their teams because they're empathetic and they're able to tune in. And so that's an example of a way that you can use your anxieties and the skills that you might have gotten from 20 years of managing your moods at work. I think another thing, and this is a really mixed bag, is our anxiety can drive us. You know, I, I think that part of my journey as an entrepreneur is that my anxiety makes me really hungry, but I've also had to become really skilled at managing it. And so I've learned to negotiate with myself in a way that has built a life and a business that is truly sustainable in a way that it might not have been had I just been pushing myself on a corporate road. Well, comparing introvertedness and, or I guess contrasting introvertedness and anxiety and some of these mental health issues, it occurs to me that introvertedness is a lot more accepted. You can talk about how you're an introvert, but it's not as accepted when you talk about your mental health issues. And this kind of goes to a systemic society issue that we need to be able to address mental health a lot more comfortably and and forget some of these these stereotypes. So, what are some what are some ways that we can we can be more okay with being upfront about our anxiety? It, when you're dealing with something like that, it's a little bit easier to put on your calendar. I need some me time. I need some some prep time, some quiet time before, like mm-hmm. say, a big interview like this. But anxiety is is one a little bit more unpredictable and two it's it's just a little bit hairier so what what strategies do you have to to deal with the anxiety part of it i will say also anxiety is very gendered right and so i think that it's hard as a woman who has anxiety to be open about it because you might get a lot of eye rolls mm-hmm. you know that there's a lot of stereotyping bet- behind women and anxiety. Um, you know, the good news, I will say, is that companies are starting to understand that mental health is just a piece of the portfolio. For example, um, Ernst & Young, the giant accounting firm, is, has actually launched a program where it's training its managers and its employees about anxiety and about how to manage anxiety at work and how teams can talk about it. So part of it is just bringing this stuff out in the open. And I would encourage anyone who's in a position of any influence and power whatsoever to be open about it. I always laugh that I'm, I'm always on the the American Airlines shuttle between Boston, New York, and Washington in my work. And you can always spot people with anxiety who are popping their Xanax before (laughs) gripping the seat when things get bumpy and have little conversations. I think that we have to have conversations that anxiety can be a normal part of your working life. And like anything, it takes skills to manage. You know, thanks to Susan Cain and her incredible book, Quiet, Workplaces are getting a lot smarter about how to manage different temperaments, especially if folks are introverts, right? They're maybe even building offices differently. I want to see a time when we understand 
how to work on a team where someone has an anxiety disorder, where we understand that someone, for example, who might have to fly a lot for work and has flying anxiety, as I do, (laughs) might need a different kind of schedule. It doesn't mean they're not going to get on that plane. I'm not giving anyone a free pass to hide. I mean, Lord knows I have struggled with that myself. I'm saying that we have to create systems around ourselves that allow us to thrive and manage our issues. So, Maura, in your book, you challenge Sheryl Sandberg's concept of women leaning into work, uh, saying that so many women you know simply can't work any harder than they already do. And if they leaned in any more, they'd literally collapse over. So maybe it's time for us to lean out instead. Can you explain that a little bit? You know, I was struck. I give a lot of talks and I mentor a lot of young women at universities at how much anxiety and performance pressure they were putting on themselves. I felt like exponentially more even than, you know, my cohort had felt 20 years ago. And when I looked at data, the data backed me up, especially driven, high-performing young women are pushing themselves in uncomfortably and unhealthily hard ways. And I think that part of it is this message that has begun that, you know, we women who are achievement oriented just need to push through all the challenges. A, I don't think that's true because I think society needs to change to support better workplaces for women. But I also think that not everyone is cut out to kill themselves every day and that that's okay. You can still be high achieving and not be Sheryl Sandberg. You might have to accept that you're not going to be a billionaire. You might have to accept, for example, that if you run a small business, it's going to truly stay a small business, right? You're not going to scale. You're not going to get venture capital. That's really hard. It's hard to compromise and it's hard to set boundaries for yourself when you're ambitious. But if like me, you found yourself on your 10th high achieving job and you're extremely depressed and you're hiding in the bathroom and crying all the time, I think it's really important to say, is this what I really want? Is there a way that I can do the work that I love, earn enough money, get just enough recognition, but just do a little bit less? Give 85% instead of 110%. So let's say that you're speaking directly to somebody that has been feeling this, that they've they've spent their, their share of time in the bathroom crying and they feel like they're killing themselves for somebody else's company, for somebody else's mission, for somebody else's dream. And and they're starting to to question their own career, like whether whether they are really cut out for all of this. What what's I guess what's some reassuring words that you could say to to that woman right then who's listening to this and feeling that right now? First of all, I would say that I feel you and you're not alone. And second, I would encourage you. And this is where this is the hard part. You have to sort of unpack whether it's the work that you're doing that needs to change or the way that you're doing it that needs to change. For example, you might do something that you love, that you went to school for many years to do, or that you really, really enjoy, but you simply cannot get on another plane. You simply cannot work another weekend. You simply cannot sit under fluorescent lights in an open plan office for another 12 hour day. That is actually not about the work that you do. It's about how you do it. And I think that coming to that realization and then saying, hmm, how can I make this different? Do I need to change the place where I work? For example, would I be much happier if I could work at home? Would I be happier if I could work, you know, in a co-working space? If I worked simply in a different place? Second, is it the pace? Is it simply draining me? I'm not cut out for this. I can't be answering emails at midnight every night. Okay, can I change that? And then there's your space. This sounds really silly, but there's a lot of data to back me up that sometimes even the fact if you are a person who, quote, feels things in technicolor like like I do, that's my friend Christina Wallace's quote, that sitting in an open plan office under fluorescent lights is damaging to you. Mm -hmm. 
And isn't it silly that your boss might lose you simply because the lights are bad in your office, right? I I think it's about, in a way, coming back to common sense and remembering that people are grownups and that, you know, if you can shift your pace, place, and space of work and still do a great job, it's worth it for everyone involved to give it another try. What about our compulsion to say yes to everything because we're either people pleasers or we think we must say yes to it all in order to drive our our businesses and our careers forward? What are some strategies for dealing with that? Well, I have a great, well, I think it's a great section in the book. I ask the smartest people I know, how do you say no? You know, it's funny. It never occurred to me that saying no is a skill, right? It's a skill just like doing Excel or, you know learning how to use Photoshop. Um, So I think, first of all, it's realizing what your personal boundaries are. Um, And I talk about this a lot in the book. Everyone has different boundaries. You know, you might be the kind of person who, if your um, boss and your team email you after 6 p.m., it gets you very anxious and it gets you upset and that is violating a personal boundary. Or you might be someone who doesn't really care when your team emails you, you're a night owl, you're perfectly happy to be in contact all the time, but you need to have that morning every week to do your own thing and work at home. So it's sort of knowing what your personal boundaries are. And then once you know those, when someone crosses a boundary, it's having a really good way to say no. And so there's a couple different tactics and I have many more in the book. One of them, which is one of my favorites, is to um, say no and then suggest a substitute. And this is a really, really good tactic because, for example, if it's an opportunity that you're turning down that you know someone else would actually really enjoy and benefit from, you're getting a double whammy. You're getting out of something that you don't want to do and you're giving an opportunity to some one else. So that's a really good one. The other is to say, you know, I really can't right now, but please check back with me after X. So for me, this book deadline, working on a book has been an incredible way to say no to someone that I want to work with in the future. I want to consider, you know, it's a valuable relationship to me, but I just can't take it on right now. So creating some kind of time um, limitation that's very clear. And um, Another is just to simply, and this is the hardest one, especially for women, to say, no, thank you, I really can't, and then to move on. And this is where I think people who deal with anxiety really struggle. It's the rumination piece. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time turning something down and then not blaming myself for it for days, sometimes weeks after. And then if I see the result of what I turned down and I feel upset or jealous or I feel FOMO, fear fear of missing out, Mm -hmm. then I'm a real idiot, right? (laughs) So part of it is just developing the skill to say no and move on. And oh my gosh, I'm not there yet, but I worship anyone who is and I'm practicing. (laughs) Maura, why do you think that it's become this stereotype that to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be that one that's working endless hours and networks constantly and, and you know, makes the deal and is just always out there 24-7. You talked about this a little bit before, but why do you think this stereotype has become and, and persisted? Well, first of all, I think it's a lot more entertaining to follow an entrepreneur who's always on the go than someone like me who's <laughs> literally probably working in bed. So I think that from an optics perspective, as we PR people call it, you know, it, it makes sense. We like this sense of dynamism. It is it is a deep American myth, right? You pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you just go for it. You never quit, right? Winners never quit quit. And so part of it is, I think, inherent to our in our national myth. I think the media, I call it entrepreneurship porn. You know, the media has yeah. really done a lot to amp up stories of, you know, the indefatigable, successful person. Um, my least favorite is the mompreneur. You know, she was <laughs> around in her kitchen and she developed an organic applesauce and now she made a billion dollars. Oh, I hate that story, but the media seems to love it, right? And then I think that part of it is social media, and uh, we're all guilty of this. We live in a culture that is 24-7, 365, curating how amazing we all are. And if you are in the sort of entrepreneurial space, that's just sort of what you think you have to do. And so you may be like even unaware of the fact that you are helping to propel the myth 
of the always on entrepreneur. Um, you know, I, I will sometimes, you know, be very happily working in my home office, you know, tootling around. I'll check Facebook and a colleague of mine is, you know, giving a talk somewhere fantastic or, you know, they've had an article or they're doing something amazing and they, you know, sort of give it a loving, loving shout out on Facebook. And my whole day is ruined, right? Because I feel really bad about myself. I feel like I'm not doing enough and I feel left out. And so I think all of these factors have come together to a moment where if you are in the entrepreneurship space, you are just surrounded by this entrepreneurship porn that makes it look so glossy and fun and, you know, sort of fetishizes this always on moment. And it takes a lot of discipline to say, I can't, it's not for me. I'm going to have a smaller business. I'm going to have my moments in the sun, but I'm going to work at home three days a week. You know, that's a really tough thing to go to go through. But I think for a lot of people out there, it, it changes your life and actually makes it better to be less successful. Right. Well, and you're right, though, that 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 this digital connection of being always connected and being always on. I mean, it's 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 a, a blessing, but it's also a curse for for many introverts. Um, yes. So how how have you developed kind of a best practice for uh, for then using digital media and social media to your advantage and not letting those kind of humble brags on social media just completely tank your day? Well, first of all, I should say that I'm like the worst offender, right? Because right after we do this interview, I'm going to post a cute photo of myself. Oh, yeah. on, of course. Right? So <laughs> I will too. Right? Hashtag not proud, but honest. So, <laughs> you know, part of it is actually learning to play the game. One of my favorite tactics that I learned is that I could actually retweet the conference hashtag at a professional event from my bed and nobody <laughs> would know that I wasn't there. So part of what's amazing about digital media is that you can hack it, right? Um, what I think is really fantastic is to work on building strong professional credibility through publishing digital media, through publishing content. And I'm not talking about content that is sort of like gorgeous Instagrams of sunsets, unless that's your thing. I'm talking about writing an article that shows what serious chops you have in your field. If you're an introvert and you don't want to be always out there, you need to be really, really smart about how you create your online footprint and how you create, and I hate this term, but I'm going to use it anyway, your personal brand, your personal professional brand mm -hmm. in a way that works for you when you're not out there. It's like an annuity, right? You want you want an investment that's earning income while you sleep. You can sort of use digital content and digital media to get out there and pound the pound the pavement for you while you're at home, you know, gardening. <laughs> Maura, I'm so glad that uh, you shared your story today and it's it's again, it you're speaking my language when you talk about just wanting to be in bed. Just work <laughs> from bed, be in bed, like think in bed, write in bed, like <laughs> I, I feel you. Yeah. Winston Churchill, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> right. Before I let you go, though, we've got a few questions we uh, like to ask everybody here on Success Talk. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. What's the best piece of advice that anyone's ever given you? Always consult before doing. Um, this is the work of Dan Shapiro at Harvard Law School, who's a negotiation genius. And um, I think that this is the most incredible advice, even if it's something silly, like asking your husband, you know, what you think, if you think you should send your kid to a birthday party on Saturday, or, you know, should I really take that $1 million round of investment? Having people in your kitchen, which I have never been in that position, but you know, <laughs> having people that you trust, who you can bounce ideas off of and get out of your own head is so important. So always consult before doing ACBD. Maura, what can you not live without? <laughs> My iPhone, of course. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't live without my iPhone, but I also, uh, I can't, I can't live without my cats. I, I call them my coworkers and it sounds really silly, but um, I have stand, standing here in my wonderful home office with my animals and uh, they're the best coworkers I could ask. <laughs> I love that. And finally, how do you define success? Loving Mondays. Um, for me, when I quit my 10th job and I went out and I was freelancing, 
all of a sudden I realized that I wasn't depressed on Sunday nights. Mm. And I would wake up Monday morning and be like, oh, cool, it's Monday. And God bless whatever, 11 years later, I still don't fear Mondays. And uh, that is really success for me. That is one of the best definitions of success I've heard, loving Mondays. (laughs) Thanks so much, Maura. (laughs) Thank you very much. Hey, hey, Josh Ellis here, the editor-in-chief of Success Magazine. Another great talk from Shelby, our director of digital content. She and Mora are truly kindred spirits, I think, which definitely made for an enlightening conversation between them. It may not seem like it from first glance, but Mora is definitely a top performer. She just had to figure out what performance was to her, which is the first place we all need to start. Mora was in the fast lane, taking high-powered jobs, working nonstop, but it was causing problems for her. She suffered from anxiety, fear, negative stress, and more, all to the point of hiding in the bathroom. But when she accepted all that and discovered who she really was, that opened up new doors for her. She realized you don't have to be a super extroverted schmoozer to be successful. That isn't what gets you places. Sure, it can't hurt, and it isn't a bad thing if you are, but it also is not a requirement of success. Some of history's most successful people were introverts, some even to the point of being reclusive. The key to being successful as an introvert is to understand your personal boundaries and give yourself time to rest and reset. Don't overbook yourself out of guilt or fear of missing out. It's okay to say no. In fact, saying no is a skill and reflects directly on your ability to completely understand yourself and know where your boundaries lie. Something else to always keep in mind is that anxiety is normal. You've heard Mel Robbins, author of The Five Second Rule, share her story here on Success Talks. She had severe anxiety, which she worked on through the use of her rule. Mora sees her introvert nature and tendency toward anxiety as a positive attribute. It allows her to tune in to other people, what they think and feel, and it can be a driving factor to move you forward, push you through things, and to being your best self. Now, you may or may not relate to all of what Mora and Shelby discussed, but that doesn't mean that in some way you can't learn from it. What their discussion all comes back to is knowing and truly understanding yourself, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a key part of being a top performer, according to the research of Brennan Burchard, author of High Performance Habits, who we interviewed on Success Talks this month as well. So start there. Get to know yourself and be accepting of who you are and how you can use that to fuel your success. That brings this month's Success Talks to a close. Thanks for sticking around and listening to the whole thing. We always appreciate it when you stay to the end because, hey, that's what counts. I hope that you heard some valuable hows that can impact your performance. Perhaps you learned how to implement some high-performance habits or how stress is good for you. Maybe you learned how to discover your calling and that hiding in the bathroom sometimes is okay. Whatever you learned, we want to know how it works for you. Share your stories with us because they are important to us. Your listening is our example of success, and we want to share that with everyone. So email us at you at success.com, Y-O-U, with your top performance stories or tips. What keeps you at the top of your game day in and day out? You know by now that our goal is is always to bring you the very best ideas from experts and forward thinkers so that you can learn and grow in your life and work. If you enjoy Success Talks and all it has to offer to help you grow, check out Success Accelerator. It's our new training program that is a one-stop shop for taking your life to the next level. It includes mentors like Brendan Burchard, Dave Ramsey, Daniel Amen, Tom Bilyeu, Carrie Wilkerson, and so many more. Visit success.com slash accelerator to sign up and get access for seven days completely free. 
And don't forget about our other podcast, Success Insider, where Shelby and I focus on a specific topic each week and give you an inside look at the goings-on here at Success Magazine. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and be sure to catch more great success talks each week. It's free on iTunes, Stitcher, success.com, and wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Thanks for listening to Success Talks. Catch every Success Talks via iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast streaming app. And of course, you can always find each talk and the full audio at success.com slash success talks. Stream and download your favorite talks today. And while you're there, sign up to receive the free newsletter, Inside Success, to get great ideas, inspiration, and quotes delivered to your inbox every week. Success Magazine Audio, copyright 2017 by Success. All rights reserved.